وأنا المحب لأهل سنة أحمد أنا غصة في حلق من عاداني Alright, perfect. Um, so the way it's gonna uh, it's gonna work is that people are gonna ask questions either in the text chat or in voice chat, and I think yep, no we have a question already. Um, so the first question comes from a person called Yahudi, and he wants to ask it uh, over voice chat. So go ahead, uh, you, you can you can talk. Okay, Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa rahmatullahi wa Hussein. So. Hello. So I am not a uh, Muslim, I am a, a Jew, and I've uh, watched some of your videos on your own channel in the Sunni Defense, and this is uh, very uh, very educational on the ideology of you know, uh, the Twelve or Shia, right? So uh, essentially, and as a, essentially, right, I want to know what, um, from you at least, for, you know, what knowledge uh, can you give us about um, generally Ibn, Ibn Saba, his historicity, Right and essentially his influence on twelve Shiism, specifically in the case of whether or not like what elements of maybe Judaism you thought came out of a dish and there are elements from foreign religions, but also you know I'm asking because you know many of the uh that are you know, many of the uh, twelve Shia I like to essentially uh, blot out the idea that uh, he is a historical figure and attempt to create him as a, a propaganda piece, paint you know as a propaganda pa- piece made against you know the. Uh, you know, Shia at Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? So, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Bismillah. So, you guys can hear me? Shall I respond to this one, inshallah? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> okay, Bismillah. So, pay good attention, guys. Ib, uh, Abdullah ibn Saba. Abdullah ibn Saba is a historical figure that has existed without a shred of doubt, but the agreement of all is- Muslim historians including Shi'i ones, early major Shi'i authorities. This is number one. Number two is, the only people who deny his existent, existence altogether, and please do not unmute, I hear some weird, strange sounds. The only people who have denied his existence altogether are some 12 uh, Shi'a revisionists. And all these people who doubt um, clear-cut matters of history, mainly from the Khomeinist camp, from that camp mainly, it's pro-Iranian regime camp. Some of the scholars have written books to completely deny the existence of the Mahdi. Of course, they have embarrassed themselves. All their books have been refuted by scholars of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, and the existence of the, uh, Ibn Saba, Abdullah ibn Saba, the year the Jew from Yemen, they, it can be proven even from the books of the Twelve Shia. And now Bakhdi's book and, and other early Shia books of Hadith even. Now here it gets interesting. Here you have to pay attention now. Of course, would you see, would you uh, expect any Trinitarian, the so-called Christians, the Nasara, would you expect any of them to admit that they are followers of Paul? Would you expect that they would admit that they are upon falsehood and that their kufr, their heresies, their zandaqat, and their ghulu, their over-exaggeration with Jesus Christ first and foremost and with his mother, Lady Mary, Maryam and with the awliya, the awliya, the saints, would they admit that all of this stems from an extremist, heretic, pagan named Paul? No, they will not admit that. However, this is our position towards them, isn't it? We believe as Muslims, and even other, other non-Christians believe that, even Jews believe that, but we believe as Muslims, that modern-day Christianity is the result, not all of it, but the essence of it. The seed of it is not Jesus, Jesus Christ's seed. It's the seed of Paul. And as Muslims, Ahl Sunnah, we believe that the seed of Tashayyu in its extreme form, in the form of Ravd, rejectionism, Ravdism, the essence was laid down by a Jew. Now here is where our opponents, the Twelvers, the more knowledgeable ones, the scholars and some of the polemicists, speakers, 
and the layman, they either misconstruct what we say or they, or they unfortunately act stupid. They say things like, wait a second, we don't take any fiqh from Ibn Saba. Here's our books of fiqh. There's no Mr. Ibn Saba among them. There's no Ayatollah Ibn Saba. There's no Sheikh Ibn Saba. Where? Where did we take fiqh? We take from Ahlul Bayt, alayhum as <laughs> Our response to them is, of course, the early Ravda were smart enough and not, not to tell the gullible that what you have been given, fed with, Huh? Is is uh, Ibn Saba's um, concocted soup fabrications? Of course not. They were told. They were told that what they have received, what they are upon about, is Madhab Ahl Bayt, the school of Ahl Bayt. And far from it. Audhu Billah that Ahl Bayt were upon the um, Kufr and Zandaq Madhab of the Twelvers. Now the question. Now now. After this small introduction, I don't want to turn it into a whole dars lecture, but it's important now. After this small introduction and important points, the question was a good question. He said, the brother or the friend, our friend asked, what have they taken then from the Jews and stuff? They haven't taken literally any salah or literally any well-known Jewish ritual, although in some matters there are similarities. And not every similarity is condemned. Some people say, yeah, Jews pray as well, and Jews affirm Moses, that Moses was righteous. No, not every similarity is, is condemned. That's a logical fallacy. If we say, oh, look, they do something that Jews do or do. Not every similarity is condemned in belief and in rituals. However, what Islam has not sanctified, and if that is done by any Muslim or any sect in the name of Islam, that action, that ritual is condemned. Not merely because it's done or believed by Jews, because Islam hasn't sanctified this belief or even rejected that belief. For example, um, the Twelvers claim there's no authentic narrations about Ibn Saba, and that's all from Saif Ibn Umar at Tamimi, from Tabari's book and whatnot. You know Tabari. The same book, Tariq, that they usually love to quote without verifying anything. Suddenly, when it comes to Ibn Saba, they become hadithists, which is all right. It's good. They should learn that not anything from books of Tariq, like Tabari's book, Tariq al Tabari, and books by Suyuti, and Ibn Ibn Kathir. Not everything. Everything needs to be verified. Everything needs to be verified. Except, like, you know, um, matters that are not of great importance like color of a flag and whatnot yeah the number of people at in an army that the hadithists the hadith scholars are lenient but when it comes to creed aqidah hurma sanctity of the sahaba and ahl bayt and the prophet you need to verify so do we have sahih narrations about ibn Saba in our books yes we have we have sahih hadith narrations now to make it short, otherwise it will turn to a lecture. We have Sahih narrations. And now, what is it that makes them Sabaites, according to the scholars? Well, Ibn Saba was a Jew who was known to go around and claim that the Prophet Isa Ali is his only successor, direct successor. And he went around and claimed that Ali curses Abu Bakr and Umar, hates Abu Bakr and Umar. Slash. And our narrations, Tarikh, Dimashq, and so on and so forth, we have narrations authentic from Ali ibn Abi Talib where he cursed this man. He cursed Ibn Saba. Why? Ali cursed him because he attributed lies to him. He over-exaggerated with Ali. Not just because Ibn Saba. That's a misunderstanding many Muslims have, including many Sunnis. They think Ibn Saba is someone, he was just, Ali opposed him just because he claimed Ali is God. This is true. He did claim this. And that's, I think, in Bukhari or Muslim. And Ali burned the Sabaites for that. Ali bin Abi Talib burned the Sabaites for it. This is true, but this is what this wasn't his only crime. His crime was also that he claimed that Ali is the only successor of the Prophet. Like the Rafid, like the Imamites. He claimed that Ali does bara'a. He disassociates himself from Abu Bakr and Umar. This is the belief of the uh, Rafid. So you understand? This is the essence, the foundations laid down by Ibn Sabah. That is why, from our perspective, Ahl Sunnah, we say 
the 12 Shi'i sect, huh? its spiritual founder, the spiritual founders were not the Ahl Bayt, the spiritual founder was Ibn Sabah. And this is about it. I wrote a I wrote a detailed article about this. Everything I mentioned with evidences, you can see in my article. I'm going to give the link to the brother. And then the admin, he can share the link with you guys, and then you can study it in more detail. All right, perfect. Um, next question comes from Boogie Man. Boogie Man, you want to ask your question in VC? Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sad Hassan. I have a question. It's going to be slow. It's going to be a bit long, but inshallah, let's start. So, my question is if Imam Ali عن, knew that he was the Imam and the Khalifa after the Prophet, why didn't he, why did he give bay'ah to Abu Bakr and Omar and even Uthman? Now, that's the part one of the question. They say, they usually say like, uh, oh, because he couldn't get it and all that. Well, if he couldn't get his own yani, imama or whatever, then how can he be the Khalifa al Muslimi? And this is one question, okay. uh, this is one bit more part of the question. Now, when he, when he got his Khilafah, why didn't he remove, uh, why didn't he allow the Mut'ah? Why didn't he take Fadak back and give it to Fatima radiallahu anha? Mm. Why didn't he take a lot of stuff that the early Khulafa changed? Please. Ahsan. Ahsan. Very good questions. Very good questions. Why did Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu did not take back the Khulafa? A valid question. Now what do they say? What do our opponents say? There is two narratives they have because of contradicting narrations. Some of them who are completely uh, deprived of any aql and who think they are very brave and very hard, you know, and <laughs> by showing the bara'a, like the Yasl Khabith, Shirazi type of Rafida, who curse openly. And all of them curse. All of them make takfir of that. Every practicing one has to do that. It's just one of them, one group is a bit smarter. And knows that by doing so, they will expose themselves and their religion completely. Those among them who think they are brave, but in reality, they are just dumb and they are exposing their religion for free. Adi Shirazi and the Yasal Khabith camp. They claim that Ali never gave bear. <laughs> they just claim he never gave bear, Aslan. So he never gave bear. Who said he gave bear? He never gave bear. He exposed them. At Saqifah, he exposed them. He went there and gave a khutbah and at Fulan and Ghadir and, sorry, at every. Uh, Shura, he exposed them. Of course, these are nothing but lies. There doesn't even exist a fabricated narration in the books of history that Ali went, at, uh, for example, uh, at the Shura of uh, Umar, for example, or the Shura of Anhu, or the Shura of Uthman, um, and exposed them. On the contrary, Ali participated. And you, when you participate somewhere, and when you do not express any, well, any, any objection, then you accept, you accept the asl, you accept the foundation. Ali accepted Shura, otherwise he would have never accepted in the first place. He did not just accept it. He participated and he gave his ra'i. I always say this, imagine, imagine a king, a kafir king. He was kicked out from the throne, right? He was kicked out from the throne by a bunch of thugs, goons, usurpers. Eh? And then imagine... These thugs invite the king who was kicked out and say to the king, Oh, yo, what's up, king? We kicked you out. We usurped your rightful place. Can you come and play election games with us because we want to elect the next king? The king would say, What are you on about? I am the king. I come nowhere. I don't play election shooter games with you. I am the rightful king. If I come, all I'm going to do is to expose you in public. This is what Ali bin Abi Talib would have done if the Rathabi 12 Imami Shi'i narrative would be true. Of course, it is not true. It is a folklore religion. It is a romanticized religion with the incapable belief, impractical, sorry, belief 
called imama. Some Orientalists, kufar, they're not Muslims. They have supported this narrative, of course, because tashayu, for a kafir, it's the most beautiful thing that can happen. Everything is chaos. Everybody became kafir after the prophet, except few prophets' wives. Most of them are evil. Of course, Orientalists. Have you seen when she has always bring some Orientalists? But look, they believe that Ali should have been an ex-kafir. And that one and that one. I'm always surprised that not... I always thought that Orientalists have ijma. Western kafir or Orientalists, that tashayu is true Islam. Of course. They are opposed to Islam. They don't believe in Islam at the very least. Of course, they will go for the most uh, uh, chaotic narrative of Islam. Hmm? No matter how much they claim that they are unbiased and just historians. Who believes that? So anyway, if that would be true, that Ali is the only Khalifa and whatnot, and he was kicked out from his rightful position, then he, <laughs> then Ali would have done what the king would have done in my story. It's just logic. Now, one group of Rafda claimed that he never gave bail. But that, that position, that claim is problematic because in their books, there's evidences, and in, in our books anyway, clear cut evidences, that he gave bail. He gave bail. Now, the only issue is, if you can call it an issue, in Ahl Sunnah, there's ikhtilaf. Did he give it immediately or after six months? They always rant about, they rant about the narration in Bukhari. That uh, Umm Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha said that he gives he gave bear after six months, yeah, but they they never read the whole narration. They mention the beginning six months and they cut out the rest of the narration. Subhan. Although the whole narration is beautiful, uh, I, I, will, I will print it out and put it here next time. If somebody wants to frame it nicely for me, I'll print it out and put it there. Why is the whole narration beautiful? Because in that narration, Ali doesn't claim he's the infallible Imam. He doesn't claim he has. Uh, knowledge of the unseen is superior than other prophets except Muhammad he doesn't claim 11, 12 imam nonsense infallibility, a hidden mahdi none of this, he just says that he was upset, that he was not consulted at Saqif, that's all he wanted to be consulted so even that narration says after 6 months but he did, and that narration mentions that he praised Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr praised him, Abu Bakr Siddiq Abu Bakr praised Ali, Ali praised Abu Bakr, love so they, you know how they sometimes try to portray Ahl Sunnah, that we are naive, that we don't know history. They think they know history. Unfortunately, especially the awam, the general folks among them, they think they know history because they have been raised up by shubuhat and looking for mistakes of Sahaba and widely cherry picking with three underlines, cherry picking from books of history, secondary sources, weak sources mainly, like tarikh books, and then because they know, as I said, they cherry pick whatever suits their whims and desires, and then they think they have more knowledge about us when it comes to history, and that we wash, whitewash history. We don't whitewash history. This hadith in Bukhari is beautiful. The hadith in Bukhari reveals that Ali had a conflict with Abu Bakr Siddiq. They had, there was an issue between them, but they resolved it. 1,400 years ago, they resolved it. Ali said, you are deserving. You're the most deserving of that position. Ya Abu Bakr. We are not jealous of that. Look, this is our Ali. We don't need this Ravadi Majusi Ali. We have our Ali bin Abi Talib, who said to Abu Bakr, once over 1,400 years ago, you deserve this position. We are not jealous of it. You are the companion of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and so on and so forth. And then Abu Bakr explained himself, and then they both praised each other, and that's it. Now there's more to it. Some scholars reconcile this narration with other narrations by other Sahaba, and some scholars have uh, hold the opinion that there were two bay'ahs. Aisha wasn't aware of it. Aisha wasn't aware that Ali gave a bay'ah, an initial one, and then he secluded himself, and then he gave a second one. So anyways, according to us, Ali bin Abu Talib has 100% um, gave bay'ah. And their books, there's evidence for this as well. They have two opinions. One group among them is completely deluded, says that they did not give bay'ah, he did not give bay'ah. And the second group says that, um, well, he did give bay'ah. But you know, all the rubbish excuses. Um, taqiyya, because of fitna, because of unity of the Muslims. You know, okay, unity of Muslims, he didn't talk about wilaya and nothing, he left it, right? Then why do you talk about the wilaya and, and talk every day about his wilaya and his haqqa and even the haqqa of 11 other ones? Huh? And by the way, of course, it's nonsensical. Have you ever, because they claim uh, the imam 
is the Imam is superior than the Prophet, except our Prophet. And even that one is a lie. It's, it's just a lip service. In practice, in practice, even the Imams are superior than our Prophet. And you can see this. I used to be a Twelver. Just by the rituals, when do they say, Ya Muhammad? Not that it's correct to pray up to the Prophet Muhammad, we pray for him. Not that they never say, Ya Muhammad, it's shirk as well to pray to Muhammad and ask your needs for, from Prophet Muhammad, but it's not the default. The default is Ali, 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 Hussein, Hussein, Mahdi, 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 their TV channels, their mosques, their places where everything is about Ali, the cousin of the Prophet and his descendants. So it's really a religion. They say Ahl Bayt, Ahl Bayt, but Ahl Bayt means the people of the house. They exclude wives who, according to the Arabic language and the Quran, are part of the Ahl Bayt. And then they include Ali bin Abi Talib, who is by extension, according to us, Ahl Bayt, yes. But it's all focused on Ali bin Abi Talib and his household and his descendants. And not any descendants, of course. The descendants from specifically from Al Hussein, who, who, according to weak historical reports, married the Persian princess in Majusiya, a Zoroastrian Persian princess, the daughter of Yazgir II, the last emperor of Persia, the Khabith. Huh? And uh, so it, it doesn't make sense, of course. It doesn't make sense that Ali bin Abi Talib just, um, you know, work with the evil, evil Sahaba for the sake of unity and whatnot. We don't have any prophet who just stopped his da'wah and call it to the truth uh, for the sake of unity. And I, I repeat, according to them, a, a, a imam is above the position of a prophet and has the same obligations as the prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look how Allah made the prophets who were thrown into the fire like Ibrahim alayhi salam Allah made them victorious over the people into the fire they were thrown and Allah made them victorious so even if they would have thrown Ali into the fire or Jafar al-Sadiq into the fire if they were true imams they would stand in Mecca and Medina and wherever or they would do hijrah like the Sahaba and call to what they allegedly supposedly believed in Imama, Viloyat, and all of these things. Of course, they did not. It's just khurafa, superstitions, lies attributed to the Ahl Bayt. That's why they never taught this, never preached this, because they didn't believe in all this nonsense, because they were Muslims, mainstream Muslims, Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah. I hope I didn't forget anything. If I forgot anything, then please uh, repeat the question. Hello? No, uh, I, I was the one that asked the question. No, you actually answered everything. If you want to add, uh, if you want to add something about uh, Ghadir Khum and why didn't the Sahaba yani, that listen to Ghadir Khum did nothing to Imam Ali to help him? When the Shia and yani, the Shia books claim there was many thousands that listened to Ghadir Khum. So, but that's, but yeah, you answered the yani, the question. Yeah, Ghadir Khum is a vast topic. I've um, on on twelve Shia dot. Uh, net please admin share these websites with all the brothers 12ashia.net and give to shias.com i have written a lot of articles and i've contributed to all, a lot of articles about this topic and then you can inform yourself in detail and of course ghadirkhum.com uh, one of our former team members farid you know from farid response he set up a whole website proving that the correct understanding the just authentic understanding of Ghadir Khum is the Sunni understanding and even the Ahlul Bayt had the Sunni understanding SubhanAllah authentic narrations on the Ahlul Bayt that Ahlul Bayt had the same understanding as Sunnis not just as Ali was a ah, the Prophet declared Ali as his friend Ali Sallallahu Alaihi this is a straw man argument we don't say he was declared as a friend no no Mawla is more than a friend we admit to that way more than a friend but it's not political power absolute and he was declared as the um, successor and the prophet is still three months alive it doesn't mean that and whoever wants to know more about this needs to put in some effort work time and study some articles there's a there's a question in the text channel um our brother asks he says uh fatima radio on her door incident where umar radio on her supposedly threatened to burn her down in musannaf ibn abi sheba is it fabricated and if so is there proof um Oh. Mm. You're just asking about Einstein. Yes, uh, no problem. Uh, the hadith, uh, first of all, we made a very detailed video about this. Very detailed video about 
because uh, the narration in Musannaf Ibn Abi Shayba, the Musannaf by Ibn Abi Shayba. Now, did you know the knowledgeable ones amongst the Rafidah, they know that the only authentic, or one of the very few and the most beloved to them narration about this incident is the one in Musannaf Ibn Abi Shayba. And you know why? Uh, I, I paraphrase one of their own scholars. One of the scholars said, all these narrations we quote about this so-called incident, the burning of the house, killing of Fatima, her, her losing her unborn, unborn child, all of these narrations are from secondary sources and are extremely weak and fabricated. So if you bring this against Sunnis, any knowledgeable Sunni can destroy you on this matter. He admitted, one of the scholars. Some of them know this, you know, they are not dumb. Some of them uh, have a little bit of knowledge and they know they are at the dead end. But unfortunately, most of them have not, do not have uh, enough um, love for truth and justice. So what do they do? They go to the next best thing. Because, you know, their narrative is a Bollywood, Nollywood, Rafidi Wood narrative. Theirs once is, 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 a, is a movie. There's ones, Fatima is about to take off her hijab, a'udhu billah. She's about to take off her hijab, the world shakes. <laughs> Salman al-Farisi is there, he's asking, well, what the heck is going on? And they say, oh, he's gonna, she's going to take off her hijab and then the world is going to collapse, it's going to go upside down, it's going to rotate. And Ali, they put a uh, rope around his neck, drag him like a stray dog through Medina. A'udhu billah. This is like, like a Hollywood, a Nollywood, and a... Hollywood, Nollywood, Bollywood. If all these three sit together, they couldn't make up nonsense like this. So it's Rafidi Wood. Theirs is absolute nonsense and made up fabrications. And they know they can't prove it. They know. They know they can't prove it from books. So they go to the next best thing. And the next best thing is it is the narration uh, in Al Musannaf by Ibn Abi Shaybar. Now, what does this narration say in short? The narration doesn't mention anything about killing, about literally burning, that something is burned, nothing about <laughs> Fatima losing her unborn child. The narration states there was fitna. And it wasn't just Ali, Zubair as well. Ali and Zubair, they were upset because there were some Sahaba that were not included in the uh, Shura of Saqifah. Hmm? Now, people say, why were they not included? Well, because the Ansar rushed there. You know, Aslan, look, the point that the Ansar rushed is a point that the Sahaba, Abu Bakr and Umar, they were not usurpers and it wasn't a coup d'etat and they didn't plan anything. Otherwise, they would have been there first. No, the Ansar were there. The Ansar are people from Medina and they thought they have the right to become the Khalifa. That itself proves there's no such a thing as Wilaya, Viloyat of Ali bin Abi Talib and 12 Imams and blah, blah, blah. It's all nonsense. Neither the Ansar nor the Muhajireen, the best people, Nobody heard of this. So they rushed. And people say, when I say rushed, as in they were first there. And you know how they always say, they play the Mazlumiyat game. They say, oh, the Prophet is still being washed and the Sahaba run. What do you mean? A person is washed by his family. So of course his family is washed. You want all of the Sahaba, Muhajir, and Ansar being in one room and everybody washing the Prophet, Wasallam. You see, look, and these people claim intellect. So anyway, this Ansar were there at Saqifa. And when Muhajireen, the heads of Muhajireen, when those among them who have had the time and were available, it wasn't just Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr, Umar, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, um, Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah was there. There was a number of them. They discussed with the Ansar and said, they didn't say, hey, no, you can't become the Khalifa or Ansar dudes because, you know, Ali bin Abi Talib is like, no, not, nobody even mentioned Ali because there is no such a thing as Ali is the only Khalifa after the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, they did mention, for example, some narrations that are not authentic necessarily. They have weaknesses in it. But some narrations mention that um, the Muhajireen, like Abu Bakr and Umar and others than them, they mentioned the Qaraba, the closeness to the Prophet. They didn't say we have a right to be Khalifa and we're the only Khalifas on earth. They, these are very عام, very general narrations by the Prophet that Khilafah has to be amongst Quraysh and stuff. They argued based on this and say, hey, Ansar, there's no way you can become the leaders. Have you forgotten, for example, the Prophet said Khilafah should be with Quraysh, general 
Quraysh is very general. Not Bani Hashim. Let, 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 alone, let alone 12 specific Imams. You understand? So, um, this is how... Uh, now, Allah, guys, please don't unmute. You know, you make me forget. This is why at uh, at, at Saqifa, then they finally agreed. Oh yeah, agreed on uh, on Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and then the vast majority of the Sahaba agreed on him. And the narration in uh, Ibn Abi Shaybah mentions a fitna where the likes of uh, Zubair and Ali did not, uh, 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 not that they rejected the Khilaf of Abu Bakr. That at the beginning they hesitated to give bayah. That's all it is. And the narration mentions in the narration it mentions that the person who opposed Ali and Zubair, guess who it was? None other than Fatima al Zahra. But they don't read the whole narration or they skip quickly through that bit. Fatima anha, in the narration says to Zubair and Ali, go out and do not come back except in a guided state. Go back, go back and give bayah to Abu Bakr. Why are you delaying it for? They come with the arguments that no, she had to because Umar would have burnt the house and blah, blah, blah. We have narrations. The, in the narration, Umar said he threatened those men. Yes, everybody was in the same house, but that's an Arabic expression. The Prophet ﷺ also made similar expressions for people who do not go to the mosque, who are close to the mosque, live not most next to the mosque, and don't attend the mosque or salah. These are expressions that were normal at that time. And uh, one final thing. The narration is not even agreed upon. <laughs> There's a khtilaf. There's there are scholars who uh, weaken the narration. So it's not a rock solid, really strong narration. So some scholars even weaken it. But I say, even if we authenticate and accept the narration, it's not an evidence for them. It still goes against them. And I too have written articles on this. It's on Gift to Shias. And... Um, well, we made, a, we made a whole video series about this on 12 Shia, on, on this only difference. So now, that's about the narration of an Ibn, uh, an Ibn Abu Shaybah's narration. It doesn't mention anything about hitting, burning, uh, literally burning. Nobody was burned, nobody was hit, no unborn child was killed. Fatima wasn't touched, not the hair of hers was touched. So it's, it's not in their favor to bring this. Jazakallah khair. Um, oh, yeah. the, the next question, uh, Yahya, he, he wants to ask in the VC. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm recently right to Islam. Islam. So, my question to you is to my little knowledge, the non Muslims, the likes of the Christians and the Jews are supposed to be Jizya yeah, under the Caliphate. Does that apply to the Shias, um, the Twelvers? The what? Sorry? They have to pay taxes under the Caliphate? Yeah, the, Shia, the Twelvers. All right. Um, as I said, I'm not a mufti, uh, but from my understanding, what I have learned, because it is related to my studies, um, we do not claim the majority of the Muslims of Al Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the scholars of Al Sunnah, and I'm a small talib al -ilm, I'm a small student of knowledge, um, and I also don't believe that all Shias are kuffar. That's a uh, um, a, a very wrong, uh, a gravely mistaken expression aslan to say shia because shia has a lot of meanings it's an umbrella term to show you and shia is an umbrella term it includes narrators and sahih al-bukhari and muslim yes uh however don't don't nobody inshallah gonna misquote me from the friends and enemies what i mean for example is in the early early stage of islam at the time of the salaf at the time after the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Atba'a al tabi'in, someone who uh, believed, for example, that Ali is superior than Uthman, just that, not superior than Abu Bakr al that was considered as a form of tashayyu'ah, Shi'ism, as a mild form already. Or someone who believed that Abu Bakr, uh, that Ali عنه, is superior than Abu Bakr and Umar, that was like more going towards the extreme form because she has sometimes mentioned there were some salaf many salaf a number of stuff who believed that ali is superior yeah it doesn't make it right it doesn't make it right it's not a correct opinion um so because tashayyu is an umbrella term and shia is an umbrella term we don't say that all shias kuffar and we don't say that um they have to be treated like 
Ahlul Kitab like Mushrikeen. No. They are treated generally as Muslims, as misguided Muslims. Yes. Can I ask a quick question or more? Yes. Um, is it okay for a Muslim to consider Ali on the same level as Abu Bakr and Umar without actually saying that Ali is better than them, just on the same level? <clears throat> well, if you ask me, we have a Sahih narration. Um, we have a Sahih narration in our books, which is Mutawatir. Uh, it reached Tawatur status. It means it was mass narrated in one way or another. That Ali, when he was the caliph, pay attention, when he was the caliph in Kufa, remember at Ali's time, Ali made Kufa the capital of the Muslim lands. Ali ascended the member, the pulpit, and he heard of some people. So you see, at his time, there was extremism, the extremism of the Khawarij, and Tashayyu evolved at that time. There were people who Ali heard who slandered Aisha. When he heard this, he said he's gonna. This one is, I think, a Tirmidhi. It's definitely Sahih narration. He, Ali said, whoever, and he, whoever says what they say about Aisha, someone here, I just heard someone slandering Aisha. He said, uh, whoever does this, I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna give him the whipping of the person who commits um, the crime of slander in Islam. And with regards to Abu Bakr, we have a even more stronger narration. Abu Bakr and Umar, where he ascended the member in Kufa and said that whoever, whoever regards Abu Bakr and Umar, whoever regards me superior to Abu Bakr and Umar, I will lash him with the lashing of the Muftari. Muftari in Arabic is someone who, who makes false accusations. Now some people, I've, I've seen even some people who are Sunnis, but who you know, they lean towards exaggerating with Ali. They say, oh, Ali didn't mean it. It's, he said it out of, out of his humbleness. Well, uh, you know, out of humbleness, we have narrations in Bukhari and in Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi out of humbleness said, don't say that I'm superior than Yunus or some other Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentioned. This is interpreted as humbleness. But Ali going on the member threatening people to whip them if they just dare to say that he, Ali, is superior than Abu Bakr and Umar. I personally don't think that you, anyone can really get away with Ali tried to be humble argument. No. Ali bin Abi Talib was uh, being frank with people. He told people that Abu Bakr Umar is superior to me. This is the ijma of the Sahaba. That some of the Salaf, some of them, a group of them after him believed otherwise. That's not a hujjah. Um, the evidences clearly show that Abu Bakr Siddiq is the most deserving of the Caliphate and the most superior of all Sahaba anhu. however if someone still holds the belief that they are the same level or even that Abu Bakr is Ali is superior than Ali that's not Kufr that's not Kufr it's a form of misguidance but it's not major Kufr far from it we are not human worshippers. We don't call upon Abu Bakr. We don't say, Ya Abu Bakr Madad. We don't claim Abu Bakr is superior than all the prophets. We don't ask our needs from him. We don't claim that uh, he can control the atoms. We don't crawl to his grave. We don't make ziyarat, arba'in to his grave. We are not exaggerators. We say, don't insult him. If someone believes that someone else is superior than Abu Bakr, that's not kufr. It's wrong. But me personally, my advice is, be a true Alid, be a true Alawi, not the heretical sect, the Nusayris. Be upon Ali bin Abi Talib's belief in Manhaj. And Ali's belief in Manhaj was that Abu Bakr and Umar are superior to him. Now, um, for the next question, uh, Abi Khaybar, he will ask a question. No. Assalamu alaikum. I'll go Hadith of dying, uh, the death of a jahil, which the Shi'is interpret to be that there's always a mm. Um, mm. Uh, obedience yeah. is obligatory towards him. Mm. Explain this. Yeah, no problem. Uh, another good question. Um, very easy to refute them on this matter. Well, you know what they normally do? They quote weak sirat, weak wordings of this narration. The asl of this narration is authentic. Whoever doesn't give bay'ah, 
whoever does not give the bi'a and there is a like ca a caliph available and the scholars agree, accept, explain it someone who is agreed by people not the likes of Yazid and stuff you know they this hadith in that form exists you know so it's basically speaking about people who deliberately do not give bi'a the pledge of allegiance to a caliph who who is agreed upon but well you know what they do they bring other weak sirat wordings as i said of this narration who says whoever doesn't have a bear that's it you just don't have a bear and this time you don't have a bear then you live in the time of uh, the death of jahiliya so where's your bear then they ask the silly question they think it's a good question but in reality they're shooting in their own foot you know why because they they ask always ask the question Okay, where's your imam? Where's your imam? We have the 12 imam. Where's your imam? <laughs> First of all, we say to them, you don't have an imam. An imam, by definition, we have Sahih narrations. And if someone doesn't believe our narrations, he can go to the books of Loha, of language. What is an imam, Aslan? What is a police officer? What is a police officer? Someone who dresses up, goes to the custom shop, costume shop, and dresses up as a police officer, and then says, hello, I'm a police officer. <laughs> it's not just looking like one. You do the duties of a police officer. Correct? A fireman. Not anybody who's dressed like a fireman is a fireman. Otherwise, at, at carnival, you know, every kid is considered a fireman. No. Someone who does the duties of a fireman. So, an imam and Sahih narrations we have that the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari Muslim that, that the imam is a like a shield. The imam is like a shield the Prophet ﷺ described the imam of the Muslims. Yani he does his duties. He defends them. You understand? This is an imam. Not a mute one. Not one on incognito on mute. It's not an imam. So claiming that we have one top and two that he is an imam, but he doesn't guide us because he's in the major occultation and so on. And that's why we have now Iranian ayatollahs who represent him and who guide us, who are fallibles, who can't even read a fatiha correctly. This is not an imam. So we say to them, you don't have an imam. That's not, this, this is not an imam by definition. Someone who's not guiding, hiding, for whatever reason. He doesn't even exist. Aslan, he's a myth anyway. But even if he would have existed, he's not guiding, he's not an imam in practice. That's why they follow fallibles. That's why the imam in Iran is Khamenei. You see? So they don't have an imam. And as for us, what about us? Do we die a death of Jahiliya if there's no imam? No. The, the problem with them is, like with all Ahlul Bid'ah, Takfiris, Rawafid, all Ahlul Bid'ah, you have to learn brothers, have one thing in common. They do not have, they do not study the text, the Aqwal, Shuruh, the interpretations, exegesis of the scholars. I.e. they don't have Tafasil, not Tafsir, Tafasil. Yani Tafasil, it's the plural of Tafsil. Yani in detail, in depth, Anna analysis of, of issues uh, all right for example the hadith as i said to you they normally bring weak wordings where it says whoever you know dies without an imam that's a weak wording whoever does wordings which say whoever yani is without bay'a and the imam of his time and so on these are authentic words and here's the thing though and let me close this, this is annoying what is this long son And here's the thing though, we have narrations that they never show you, or other Sunnis and when they do their propaganda works, the Rafidah. They never show the ahadith of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. You know guys who Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman is, anhu. he was the person who sahab sir, the secrets of the Prophet wasallam. Secrets not in the absolute sense, the Prophet explained everything. But some things he told some Sahaba, and then the Sahaba told everybody else, including us, it reached us. Did you know that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman narrated many narrations that completely destroy Imamism, Twelveism, including Zaydism? Did you know that? This Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he asked the Prophet, he was very intelligent, he asked a lot about a lot of fitan, plural of fitna. What, what if, what if? So one time he asked the Prophet, and this narration is a Bukhari Muslim, he asked the Prophet, but what if there's no Imam? What should I do? 
Guess what the Prophet said? The Prophet didn't say, don't worry, there's 12 Imams, there's always going to be Imam, and there's going to be a hidden Imam, because that's all nonsense. Khurafat, superstitions. Khuza'abalad, nonsense. Made up by the early Jews, Ibn Saba, and then late, and that seed was planted in Kufa and in Persia, and then it grew there, the Majus. And now it's the, they are the flag bearer of this nonsense. The Prophet didn't say anything about, don't worry, there's always an Imam. He said something that completely destroys 12 Islam, Imamism, Shiism completely. You know what he said? He said at that time, seclude yourself. SubhanAllah. Look what the Prophet said. This hadith is famous. That's why us, especially us, Ahl so we need to, you see, you don't even need to be an expert on 12 Islam, Imamism to refute their religion. Any good talib or ilm, someone who goes to the masajid, someone who learns Sahih al-Bukhari, goes, just goes through Sahih al-Bukhari. He would know this. That um, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman asked the Prophet, what if there's no Imam? Then the Prophet said, then seclude yourself. Stay away then from everything from fitna. So that means there will be times where we have no Imam. And that destroys Shiism, Imamism in all its form. And that's a hujjah upon us. It's Sahih according to us. And uh, that explains the other hadith. That uh, dying the death of Jahiliya, that comes with conditions. If there's an agreed upon caliph, ruler, not anybody like Yazid or modern day rulers and whatnot. Yeah. The next question will be from uh, Muhammad Azam, inshallah. Yes. Uh, yes, my question is how do you deal with the problem of the lack of consistency when it comes to you know, discussing with Shias. Because, you know, some will say that, no, I don't follow, follow so-and-so scholar, I follow Sistani. Another one would refute the positions of the other and say, I follow Khomeini. And then someone will say, I'm an Akhbari, I'm a Shirazi. And, you know, some will say, you know, we consider only narrations from Al-Kafi. Some will say, no, we don't, we don't consider all the narrations from Al-Kafi. So how do you, uh, you know, what what is this... Uh, what can you say? What is the most authoritative source on which at least there is some sort of consensus of the Shias? Because I, I frankly get tired of, you know, uh, you know, every single one of them, one of their, if you show them a clip of one of their scholars or, or Zakir, they'll say that oh, that's not the one we follow. And, you know, the other one will will give a, a like a tacit, uh, what do you call, denouncing of that. Oh, we don't believe that, but it's not exactly, you know, uh, denouncing it properly. So how do you like, cornered them that this is in your book and you all agree this so what book is that or what source is that mm -hmm. anything else yeah i mean that that's the gist of it i'm like the how do you deal with the problem of the lack of consistency among shias when you're you know discussing with them allah bless you allah barak fiq brother very beautiful question um Here's the thing, brother. I, I, I can feel your pain. <laughs> I can tell you are someone who struggled with them. Not because of your lack of knowledge, but because of their inconsistent. Incon they're inconsistent in their approaches. And it's true. But one thing I need to say, and it's not primarily directed to you, it's a general advice. First of all, not everybody should debate anyway. And not just, not you know, when we say these things, they say, oh, you're scared of us. Well, we're the last people to be scared of Rafa. We have challenge many of the you know mouthy speakers and all of them are running away till this day no it's not about being scared or being afraid it's about it's not a job of anybody dealing with shubhad with al bid'ah is a toxic topic i myself sometimes well i i wish that i was just born sunni and i have nothing to do with this just in my ibadat i'm busy for ibadat but it's the taqdeer is the decree of allah it always drags me back to this topic because I know what I know and I have to share my knowledge, the little knowledge that I have. But I always give the advice of those in the room, especially my younger brothers, you know, I'm mid thirties now. I think most of you are younger than me here, definitely younger than me. Take my advice. This is not your job. Your job is not to be on Twitter and on Facebook and on Discord and on other things to discuss Shia every day. This is not your job. It's not good for your heart. And not just Tashay or anything, even Christianity. This is not your job. And whose job is it, you might ask? Well, it's the job of the mutakhassasin, the people whose expertise revolves around these issues. Experts. 
That's why it's not fard ain. You know what's fard ain? To be good to your mothers. Fard ain is to be good to your neighbors. Fard ain is to uh, benefit your community. Fard ain is your salah on time. These things are fard ain. Yani, a fard ain. You understand what fard ain means, yeah? It's a compulsory, compulsory upon your necks. Refuting Ahlul Bid'ah is Fard Kifaya, which only makes sense. Fard Kifaya means a group amongst the Muslims does it. A group, not literally one, just one, one, one group somewhere in the corner in the world. But yani, a group as in groups spe spe specialize on it. Like Pakistani, uh, Indian, Urdu speakers. They meet online. They meet <coughs> in Hyderabad. They meet in Karachi. And they refute the Rafada, the books, the articles, them. Someone in the Arab world, Iranian Sunnis, Afghan Sunnis, Albanian Sunnis, Bosnian Sunnis, Moroccan Sunnis, North Africans, Baghariba, Egypt, Yemen, Oman, Khalid, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, the Philippines, and so on. So this is very important. First of all, if in the recent time you have just busied yourself with learning about Ahl al and refuting them, that's not your job. Yes, it's, you should be happy. You can enjoy the work of those who have refuted them. You don't need to do that. I would, wallahi, I would love it if that wasn't my business and I could relax and I could watch Sunni Defense stuff and other experts on this stuff. This is number one. Now, this brother sounded like someone who has knowledge and is dealing with them a lot. There is no one perfect approach, brother. The problem is... Can somebody please mute his mic? There's some sound. The problem is that, as you know... <laughs> sometimes they say not sometimes the scholars openly say we don't have a sahih hadith book like you you know as if it's something to be proud of this is embarrassing every Islamic sect has like something that is really um, the best shot and generally speaking sahih of course even Bukhari well, many many Shia, most Shias don't understand it at all but even many Sun lay, Sunni lay people laymen don't understand Bukhari is not a holy infallible book Bukhari includes narrations that are not even hadith nabawi. Now nobody misquote me thinking I'm a heretic. I'm Abu Layth the Zindiq and claim Bukhari is weak and everything. No, I'm not saying that. Bukhari is generally sahih, 100%. And there were critics of it from the big scholars like Imam Dar Qutni. He weakened like a few narrations. Imam Al-Albani, he weakened a few narrations. Under 1%. Under 1. And it includes narrations that are not hadith nabawi aslan to begin with. For example, that the Prophet wanted to commit suicide. She has always quoted this. It's not a hadith. It's, it's not a hadith. It's not authentic. authentic. Why did Bukhari didn't include it in a preference? Yeah, Bukhari is a human being. He included it. He wanted to include some things that had to do with the beginning of the revelation. That's a wrong belief and we don't believe in it that the Prophet wanted to commit suicide, for example. It's not a hadith. But they, they don't know this. They just copy-paste online. Most of them don't speak Arabic, don't speak Persian. They can't verify anyway. So anyway, as I said, for most of you, you shouldn't involve too much into these matters. You should ask experts. You should go on our websites. Why did we do all this hard work? Why did we wrote thousands of articles, thousands of hours of work on websites like uh, the Sunni Defense? Sorry, uh, 12shia.net, which is from the Sunni Defense, give to shias.com, and many other websites. Why? It's for you. It's all prepared. It's like a meal that is already prepared, a healthy meal. And uh, for those like this brother who has more knowledge and says, but I do deal with them, that is unfortunately not one approach. You have to have enough knowledge so you know with who you're dealing with. You're dealing with an Akhbari type, you know, you need to know what to use best against him. With an Usuli type, Khomeinist Usuli, uh, Shirazi Usuli, you get it with the time and so on, the gist of it. Barakallahu The next question, inshallah, would be from Simply High on Life. Uh, we can go next. Um, Wa alaikum salam Does Imam Bukhari narrate from Kharijis and haters of Ahlul Bayt? If so, why? Mm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Very good question. Does Imam Bukhari narrate from Kharijis uh, the Khawarij? And if so, why? First of all, uh, not just Imam Bukhari. Other uh, scholars of hadith narrated from Ar from Shias, from Khawarij, from Qadris, you know, the people who 
deny the qadr I have a mis a misguided understanding of it let's put it that way from uh, from the jabariya you know jabr people who claim that everything we do is absolutely forced they have a misunderstanding of predestination so uh, you i can answer the question by explaining to, uh, by, by saying to you that yes he did and why because of sheer fairness that's what people who don't study these matters you know they just try to score brownie points they throw around accusations i've dealt with this shubha in the past i'm not accusing you i'm saying unfortunately many of our Shia opponents oh bukhari uh, narrates from a dasabi he narrates from someone who was one of the i don't know killers of hussein or from a khariji or someone who hated ali you know they mention this stuff i know they mention oh bukhari narrated from this guy who hated ali but you know what they don't mention bukhari also narrated from this guy who hated uthman do they mention this bukhari narrated from someone who used to insult muawiyah do they mention this no now why why is because in very simple words as the scholars of hadith said if the scholars of hadith would have rejected a narrator because of his bid'ah, his bid'ah, bid'ah as in his bid'ah beliefs, then the sunnah would have vanished. Because remember, it was a time where many people heard the truth, knew portions of the truth, but they adopted false beliefs. Do you understand? So, for example, there is a Khariji, but he heard something that is the truth, and the scholars narrated from him. Now, they might argue, but well, wait a second, this Khariji in particular was a hater of Ali, and you accept his narration, why? That comes all with conditions, not blindly, we don't accept blindly. For example, most scholars say that if we take narrations from Ahlul Bid'ah, then with the condition that the person of bid'ah does not narrate anything in support of his bid'ah. For example, we have a narration of a Khariji, and that narration Ali is criticized very harshly or portrayed really bad, extremely bad. We don't accept this, because this is accepted from someone. But we have a narration from a Khariji, who is known as not lying, and it has nothing to do with his bid'ah. We accept the narration. Even if he's a hater of Ali or a hater of Abu Bakr, for that matter. Or if he's a Nasabi or he's a Khariji or if he's a Shi'i. As a matter of fact, did you know that in Bukhari, there is plenty of Shia narrators and Shias always misuse this point and they write long articles about this which can be refuted with two or three lines which is, and I mentioned it earlier, the early Shias have nothing to do with the Shias of today. The vast majority of early Shias were political Shias, if you like. Or at most, there were people who preferred Ali over Uthman or Ali over Abu Bakr, and that's it. Nothing to do with the modern day Twelvers. They did not believe in Twelve Imams. They did not uh, have Kufri Shirki beliefs. They did not pray to Twelve Imams. They did not claim that Imams are superior than the Prophets. None of this nonsense. The vast majority of them. Now, so nobody misquotes me. There at that time there were some extremists, of course. The Sabaites were around, and there were some Rafadi narrators even. But even they were not as extreme as modern day Rafadis. Because even the Rafadism in its extreme form is constantly uh, evolving to the to the worse. So yes, in a, in a nutshell, Bukhari narrated from Nasibis, Kharijis, Shiris, Qadris, from many Ahl Bid'ah. With conditions. However, she as will only show you one side. They will say, oh look, he narrated from this person. And Bukhari and other scholars narrated only if they did not narrate in support of the bid'ah. And the narrations, for example, there's this narration from this Shi'i person in Bukhari. Shi'i, Shi'i person. Or a Nasibi. It's not in support of his bid'ah. And often these narrations have supportive evidences. Very important point. For example, Bukhari narrates from this Khariji or this Shi'i or this Nasabi, but because there is supportive evidence, because someone similar narrated something similar to that line as well. I hope it's understood, inshallah. Um, just, just to 
uh, ask a question, I'll, uh, my personal question as well. Um, when I was studying uh, Hadith science, uh, I studied a little bit, um, and they were saying that uh, one of the conditions of a Hadith is that it has to be a ghayr of fasikh. So it cannot be a fasikh, you know, but, um, for, a, for a Hadith to be sahih. Mm-hmm. But, like a khariji, for example, they will be sinners. How would we uh, mm-hmm. answer that? Well, as I explained, the scholars, the scholars explain that there is exceptions. They made exceptions for people who held bid'a beliefs. That didn't make them by necess- necessity a fasiq. You understand? Yeah. For example, uh, for example, a Shi'i, a Shi'i who believed that Ali is superior than Abu Bakr and Umar. This is a wrong belief. This is a wrong belief. It's it's a form of dalala. It's a form of misguidance. But he's not completely excluded as a narrator with conditions with conditions so the condition you mentioned is generally applied and it's correct it's not to be a fasik but what do scholars mean with fasik in that case for example someone who is known for openly lying for example openly doing for example zina and stuff like that these are general rules and as I said, I think it's Ibn Hajar who said it, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani or Imam, the, Imam al-Zahabi. One of the two definitely said that if we were to reject all the narrations of the early Shias, they had nothing to do with Imamites, the early, very soft Shias, and some few of the Khawarij and few of the Nawasib, and Qadriya and Jabriya, many al bidah then the Sunnah, there would be nothing left of the Sunnah because they were amongst those who narrated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I'll Tabarakla. the next question, inshallah, from Boogie. Uh, Assalamu alaikum again. Wa My question The Shia claim that Muawiyah was a kafir. Now, at the same time, we found find the infallible Imam Hassan Radiallahan gave up the Khilafah to him when he had the sources, when he had the army, and he had some of them in them. Al-Muhajirin, Al-Ansar, etc. And he didn't fight him, he gave up the Khilafah to him. Then we find the Hassan with less sources, less army, less everything, and fought, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I mean the Hussein, with less sources, went and fought uh, Yazid. Now, who is right? Either Muawiyah wasn't a Kafir, as they claim, or there's something you know, weird with, with the situation with Imam Hassan Hussein. Someone must be right and someone must be wrong. If you can answer in short. Ayyoh. Ayyoh. Kishaft al at Tanaqud and Al Qum. Yes, the brother obviously uh, he revealed a big contradiction amongst these people. Now the thing is, don't think that Ahlul Bid'a, Ahlul Dalala that they give up. Wallahi, one thing I learned when I left the Shayyu. Well, it was a process. It was a process of months where I was discussing and debating with the ex-Shia Mu'ammam Tobinhead, one of the scholars who fled to Britain. He taught me something, you guys, and I share it with you. It's one of the best things I can share. From my heart to your hearts, guys and listeners, take it from me. He said, don't think that just because you refuted something with solid arguments of logic and you've proven the stance the position the argument of your opponent is completely false batil mardut rejected don't expect your opponent to say mm, alhamdulillah i was wrong salam alaikum i'm gonna accept no normally people sectarian people ahlul dalala misguided sects they are extremely biased they don't accept the truth even if it's right in front of the face so the brother brought a very important point he said anhu, with no army fights although this is not our aqidah our aqidah is by the way this is not our aqidah our aqidah is not that al Hussein wanted to fight we have authentic narrations that he thought that people want him and there is no fight he has no knowledge of uh, our, our our narrative, our understanding of Karbala is way more logical and respectful 
towards the Ahl al-Bayt al-Husayn radiyallahu anhu because we don't believe that he wanted to war because even some some of our Salafi brothers and Sunni brothers they make mistakes they they say oh he, he he made khuruj he went out to fight he didn't went out to fight he was given the promise that they want him this guy is not even accepted as a khalifa then he was stopped at the way by the thugs by the criminals by the goons of Yazid Ibn Sa'd and so on and so forth and he did not want to fight he said to them that listen let me go to Yazid I can talk to them they don't mention to you these authentic narrations so first of all this is our this is the authentic reasonable Sunni narrative of Karbala al Hassan is not some Persianized Rambustani who who takes 70 people predominantly women and children so they can get massacred this is an insult to him However, their narrative, as the brother pointed out correctly, they do believe that he has Ilm al and he went there to make a point, to make a stance, to speak out against Yazid, to save humanity, save true Islam. You know, like all nonsense they have taken from the belief of the Nasara, by the way, the belief of Al Fida. You know, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God, Al Hussein is the Lamb of God. Some of the scholars even call him, you know, the blood of God. In Arabic, they say, Tharullah. Thar is another word for blood, the blood of God. So this is the narrative. And the narrative is also that Al-Hassan left his bay'ah, left his khilafah, authority to Muawiyah. How is this re recon How can you reconcile this? Now, brother, all I can say to you is these people, they don't give up. They insist on their battle and let them insist. We call to the truth. We bring the authentic narrative and people with aql, tr people with intellect, actual truth seeker they will choose that which is better which one is better first of all al hassan ibn ali who gave bay'ah you know many shias deny this they say it was a peace agreement like the peace tr agreement of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the mushrikeen and hudaybiyah and so on and so forth this is one of the biggest lies they repeat it wasn't a peace treaty that's a lie you know this one you have to pay attention guys they always water that incident down and they claim that, um, yeah, uh, uh, it was just a peace treaty. So what? The Prophet wasallam he made peace treaties with Mushrikeen. Huh? And now Al Hassan made a peace treaty with Muawiyah. He's also a Kafir Mushrik. Billah, they claim. This is a lie. This is a lie, subhanAllah. Why? Because there wasn't just a peace treaty, it was bay'ah. And you can look up, ask any Arab person. Arabic speaking person to open dictionaries and to open Islamic books what bay'ah means. Do you know what bay'ah means? عند العرب, what, when an Arab says bay'ah, even pre Islam, they had this concept. Bay'ah means you pledge allegiance. You pledge allegiance to someone. He is your emir. He is your leader. You obey. Mutlaqan. And of course, in Islam, we have shurut. We obey as long as we are not. Um, commanded to do evil or haram like we don't do anything the ruler says so al hassan giving bay'ah to who to an alleged kafir usurper mushrik najis nasibi as they call him as they call muawiyah that itself doesn't prove that muawiyah is the best sahabi we never claimed this muawiyah is, Muawi is from the tulaqa he's from the lower rank sahaba However, he was a Muslim, he was a Sahabi, nobody accused him of shirk, and Al Hassan gave bay'ah to him. And Al Hassan, as the brother correctly stated, had an army. You know, they come with tons of excuses. Yeah, but he did not trust this army and this and that. What do you mean he did not trust his army? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported Ibrahim when he was thrown in the fire. In the fire, Allah supported him against the Mushriki. This man has an army. If he's the alleged Imam, only true Imam, he gives his Khilafah to a Kafir, impure, Mushrik, polytheist, Kafir enemy of Ahlul Bayt, as they claim Muawiyah was. Why would he do that? Of course, Muawiyah wasn't that. Muawiyah wasn't a Kafir and Mushrik and so on and so forth. He wasn't. Otherwise, Al Hassan would have never done this. Al Hassan gave the Bay'ah because it was prophesied by the Prophet. We have in hadith in the Sahihain by the Prophet who said, uh, ibn Sayyid, this my son, this son of mine, is a Sayyid, is a master, is a leader. 
he will reconcile between two Muslim groups. And subhanAllah, this prophecy came true. Because two Muslim groups, they claimed the Rafa, they claimed the Muawiyah and his group, they are Nasiris, enemy of Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet didn't describe them as this. The Prophet said the Muslim group, i.e. his son's grandson's side, Al Hassan ibn Ali anhu, and this group of Muawiyah. They reconciled and they did reconcile. And Al Hassan gave bay'ah. And Al Hassan is superior to Muawiyah. But that was the best thing to do in that situation, and he did give, and that proves that the very least the Islam of Muawiyah. Because it's never ever allowed in Islam to pledge allegiance to a kafir mushrik enemy of Ahl al-Bayt It's not allowed. So our narrative is more reasonable, logical, superior, historical. Whereas theirs is based on a romanticized, Persianized narrative because they have to push this agenda, which is what? The Imam of 12 Imams, which is a Khurafa, Dalala. Yeah. Uh, the uh, next question. Yeah, the next question is um, from Ali. He says, he says, uh, why is, uh, why Ibn Taymiyyah didn't like Ali Radio? So, <laughs> <laughs> who's out? You know, um, uh, there there is a saying in English. You know, some people need to study intellect, uh, like they need to study uh, logic. To a certain extent, at least. The onus is on the claimant. I can't go around and say, Are oh, you? Why don't you like me? Oh, why didn't you, did you insult that woman? Excuse me? How? Wh what? You have to bring evidence. You have to bring evidence that Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahmatullah Ali, did not like uh, Ali bin Abi Talib. Now, I want to add one thing to this. They will cut out statements of Ibn Taymiyyah. Pay attention, very important. Rather the claim Ibn Taymiyyah is a Nasabi, is an enemy of Ahl al-Bayt, which is, I used to believe this when I used to be a Shia. I used to believe, I used to believe, I said he's the biggest boogeyman. There's two boogeyman for modern day Shias, two. Ibn Taymiyyah and Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahmatullah alayhi wa ghafarallahu la. They don't know that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab named his children Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, Ali. Eh, wallah, he named his children like this. And even the modern day descendants of Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, one of the Imams of the Haram in Medina, you know what his name is? Hussein Al Sheikh. You know what Al means? Al means like a followers or descendants. So he's Hussein from the descendants of the Sheikh of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. So in the, in the family tradition of Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, they have a tradition to give names like Hassan, Hussein, Mu'aw, Hassan, Hussein. Fatima Ali. Proper Nasibis, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, these are the two main big boogeymen. And they lie upon them a lot. And I used to believe these lies. Until I did research and so on. Obviously, I left the Shayyar, alhamdulillah. Ibn Taymiyyah did not hate Ahl Bayt. Far from it. He loved him in his works. A man is judged based on his clear-cut words. Not on cut-out statements. A man is based on his clear-cut words in his works. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a book about Aqeedah, more than one book. And his Aqeedah al wasatiyya that is available in English language. Any, any little Sunni student of knowledge, I read this, I read Aqeedah al wasatiyya the, the month when I left the Shayyah. And Aqeedah al wasatiyya Shaykh al-Islam mentions, like every other Sunni scholar, loving Ahlul Bayt is part of our Iman. It's part of Ahlul Sunnah. To love Ahlul Bayt and to give them their rights. Minus Minus Rafidi Gulu. Rafidi Gulu. Minus Rafidi over exaggeration. We don't need that Ahl Bayt. We don't need that Ali bin Abi Talib. That Ali bin Abi Talib and that Ahl Bayt is a fake one, is a romanticized, Persianized, Khurafi, superstitious one. We don't want this. Never ever be going to accept the Ahl Bayt. Just like we're never ever going to accept the Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, of the Nasara. Some half naked man like this, skinny, hanging there, and that's Rabbul Alameen, Billah, killed by some a bunch of Romans who were wearing like mini uh, mini skirts. Billah, that's not my Jesus. Don't believe in this Jesus. And you are Ali in Ahl Bayt. I don't believe in this. So what do they do? They bring statements of Ibn Taymiyyah, where Ibn Taymiyyah refuted a well-known zindiq of his time, Ibn Mudannis Al Hilli. They call him Ibn Mutahhar Al Hilli, a Rafidi scholar of Iraq back then. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote his magnum opus, his major book, 
Men had you sunnah nabawiyah and refutation of this Rafadi Zindiq, yeah, this Rafadi scholar. And in it, Ibn Taymiyyah made ilzamat. These juhal, they don't know what ilzamat are. Ilzamat is, for example, you say, if you say so and so, then that would make Ali so and so. Do you understand? Like, for example, if you say that, I, that uh, Fatima was killed, then that shows that Ali was a coward. Billah. So they cut out stuff like this and say, oh, look, if it talks bad about Fatima, bad about Ali. They don't go back. A truth seeker, a just person, goes always back to the muhkamat. Muhkamat, yeah? The, the, the clear cut. The clear cut text. In the Quran, in the Sunnah, and in the statement of the scholars. And even in, if you and my statement. For example, people claim about me things. My opponents claim that I'm a Al-Qaeda supporter, ISIS supporter, although I condemn all of them. Hmm? Because they cut this, 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 this and out, go to some old web website, this, this, and claim these things against me, for example. Or they claim these lies against Ibn Taymiyyah. So what we do, we go back to the muhkamat, to the clear cut, aqwal, nusus, text and statements of Allah, his messenger, scholars, you and I, and then we know his stance. His stance of Ibn Taymiyyah, he respected and loved the Ahl Bayt, just like me and you. He defended the Ahl Bayt even. Sheikh al-Islam in his books cursed the killers of Hussein Radha al-Anu. Did you know that? Most Shias don't know this anyway. Ibn Taymiyyah said, may the curse be on the ones who were responsible for the killing of Hussein, who killed him, and so on and so forth. He said, Al-Hasan Hussein are the Sayyidah Shababi Ahl al-Jannah. Hadith Sahih narrated by Abu Huraira whom they call Eliyah and they call him a Nasabi. But one of the narrators of the famous hadith that al Hassan Hussein are the leaders of the youth in Jannah, Sayyidah Shababi Ahl al-Jannah, is Abu Huraira. And Ibn Taymiyyah uh, mentions this hadith and he praises al Hassan and Al-Hussein and all the lofty virtues and merits and he praises Fatima and Ali. All he says is what we say, what I say, what all of our sunnah say. He rejects their ghulu, their extremism. And that's enough, brothers. Trust me, as an ex-Shia, I'm telling you. Not every layman Shia. Wallahi, they're not our enemies. The majority of Shias are Iranians. They're not even practicing. They are semi-agnostics. Loosely, uh, they loosely ascribe themselves to Tajay or to Shiism, if at all. And even the religious Shias, they're victims of this con called Tajay or Rafd, Imamism. They don't know better. They don't know better. Although most of them, they don't know better. They are not the enemies. Yeah. Jazakallah. Um, Wait. How long will you stay with us? Go on, inshallah. I will let you know if I need to go. Um, the next question uh, someone asked was, in the farewell speech of the Prophet, someone claimed the Sunnis added the part where it talks about leaving the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, whereas, it's supposed to, whereas it was the, the Book of Allah and the people of the people of my house. All right, here's a challenge to all the Shias in the world. Bring us one Sahih, Sahih, not any. Bring us a Sahih narration that the Prophet at Hajjatul Wada, his last Hajj, said Quran Ahl Bayt. Wallahi, you will never be able, because there's no such a thing. And then the more knowledgeable ones, I give you a warning, those who even attempt. Go to your more, more knowledgeable ones. Guys, please uh, mute yourselves. Go to the more, more knowledgeable ones of your own people. They will tell you there is no authentic narration. There is weak and fabricated narrations. Weak. But there is no evidence that the Prophet said Quran Ahl Bayt at Mecca. He did not. The authentic, most authentic narration is in Bukhari. And in Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn uh, Muhammad ibn Ali Ibn al Hussein, Ibn Ali bin Abi Talib, alayhum as salam wa radhiallahu anhum. He's also known as Al Baqir, and the Shia claim him as their fifth infallible Imam. Of course, he has nothing to do with them. They just lied upon them. Thousands of narrations they uh, attributed to him. This Muhammad al Baqir was one of the great scholars. The scholars of the, the Salaf praised him, Imam Dhahabi praised him. But he was, wasn't a Twelver. He never claimed to be an infallible Imam. He went to Jabir. He went to Jabir the Sahabi, who was blind at the time, and he asked him about Hajj. By the way, in the chain of narrations in Bukhari is also Jafar al-Sadiq, which proves that he took... No, sorry. And that one, I don't know if Jafar al-Sadiq was, well, Imam Baqir is definitely. 
And Sahih Muslim, I think, is the narration. Either in Bukhari or Muslim. So anyway, he, the, the Ahl Bayt, went to Jabr. Again, this destroys Shiism anyway. Because they claim that the, the uh, Imam Baqir, uh, they claim that Jabr ibn Abdullah, the Sahabi, he was a student of Imam Baqir, which is nonsense. The reality is, Jafr, uh, Imam Baqir, the father of Jafar al-Sadiq, was a student of, of Jabr. Jabr is superior than him. Of course he is. He's a Sahabi. He's a Sahabi. He's a righteous man, a Sahabi. And he took knowledge from him. In that narration, Imam Baqir goes to, uh, to Jabr and asks him, tell me about Hajj. Anyway, in that long narration, then he tells him, and the most authentic narration is that at Hajjat al Wada, the Prophet didn't say anything about Ahl Bayt. He just said Quran. I leave you the Quran. And uh, he didn't, uh, well, just one second. He said, I leave you the Quran. And in the most authentic narration, Sheikh Uthman, Khamis, other scholars explained as well. The most authentic narration about Hajj doesn't include Ahl Bayt nor Sunnah. That's interesting, isn't it? Neither Ahl Bayt nor Sunnah. Now, no uh, hadith so called Quranists, Zanadiqa, need to be uh, gassed and hyped up and thinking they got something. No, no, no. The, the Quran includes clear cut, the clear cut command of following the Sunnah. Um, it's in some other narrations, and Malik's Muwatta and other books, Sunnah is mentioned, but the most authentic one doesn't mention Sunnah and neither Ahl Bayt. Ahl Bayt is authentically mentioned at Ghadir, but not as in following them. In the context of supporting and loving and taking care of Ahl Bayt. That's why the Prophet Ed Ghadir in Sahih, Sahih Muslim did not say, I leave behind you Ahl Bayt, follow them, 12 Imams, none of this. Follow Ahl Bayt, Ahl Kisa. He said, Udhakirukum Allaha fi Ahl Bayti, Udhakirukum Allaha fi Ahl Bayti, Udhakirukum Allaha fi Ahl Bayti. He repeated three times, I remind you of my Ahl Bayt. It's an Arabic statement, everybody understands this. Has nothing to do with follow them, let alone follow specific ones. He, he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, kept it general. Why? Why didn't he talk about 12 imams? Why did he keep it general? General, very important point. I remind you about Ahl Bayt. And he addressed a specific people. People, not the people at Hajj. Because it's not primarily about them. It's not them who's, who are going to live with the Ahl Bayt primarily. The people of Medina. When they stopped between Mecca and Medina, they were heading towards Medina. He reminded them to take care of my Ahl Bayt. And this is the most authentic narration. There's other narrations that mention, I leave behind Quran and Ahl Bayt. But all of these narrations have ilal in them. They have weaknesses in them. All of them. And of course, Shias and even Zaydi type of Shias, they try really hard to authenticate them. But the most correct authentic narration is the one in Sahih uh, Muslim. But the Prophet says, after Hajj, after Hajj, he, after he mentioned Quran to all Muslims, then on the way back to Medina to a specific group of Muslims, he mentioned Quran again and he mentioned uh, to take care of his family. Yeah. That, by the way, it's also explained, that's by the way, explained many articles we have on 12ashia.net. We have at least two videos where we go in deep, where thoroughly. We analyze all the narrations. Our brothers, the experts in our team, have analyzed every single narration about Al-Thaqalain, the two heavy things, Quran or Sunnah or Quran and Ahl Bayt and so on and so forth. You can go on the playlist on Sunni Defense and watch them and you can go to share.net and read the articles now. Yeah, I'll link that, inshallah. And, uh, uh, Jazakallah. The next question, inshallah, um, is a Shia. He's saying that, um, did you go to a Shia Hosa? Uh, when he when he was younger, and uh, who was um, who was your marja? When he was Shia. Hmm. No, uh, I was. Uh, Allah saved me. I was about to go to a Hausa. I was literally about to go. My father saved me. Of course, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saved me. Thumma, my father, as in he, literally prevented me physically from going. Because my father, like most Iranian Shias specifically, is burnt out and hates Shiism. Unfortunately, dislikes Islam altogether, which is very common amongst Iranian Shias. 
and he prevented me alhamdulillah otherwise you would see him today probably with a turban and stuff and who was my marja my marja well at least i had i switched between marjas at the beginning a bit it's normal but i had my first marja was uh ayatollah lankarani and then it was uh, khamenei khamenei yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, the next question, inshallah, um, the brother asked in the text channel, he says, did Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu anhu have uh, children? Like it's more difficult to read about it than uh, Hassan radiallahu anhu, his brother, uh, because it's only Shia sources speaking about Hussein lineage. Why do you think that that is? And did Hussein radiallahu anhu really have children? Well, and the brother says... Uh, of course he had children and why is it only Shia sources of course Shias would claim that it's because we are these lovers and you don't love them you you lot love don't love them enough of course it's not true it's like it's like if you type Jesus is there more Christian sources Kufr sources about Jesus yes why because well they have over exaggerated with them with him with Jesus Jesus Christ Isa al-Masih ibn Maryam alayhi they've always exaggerated with him they claim him so if you type Jesus most of the stuff you will unfortunately find is from Christian sources now if you type Al Hussein Al Bayt most of the stuff is from Arafati sources not because they love them more and we haven't done our homework even in Arabic you won't believe how many beautiful books exist subhanAllah there's this bookshop massive like a football hall it's called Dar Makkah I'm advertising now for free they should give me one book for free when I come next time <laughs> If I come next time. They have sections about Fadail Ahl Bayt, the merits of Ahl Bayt, the merits of Al Hussein, Hassan, details about their life, their children. The problem is, brother, uh, although you are even lucky still, you know, in other languages, French, German, there's even less stuff translated. The English is still good. You know, you guys have even, I mean, I think all of it or most of it of Tafsir uh, Ibn Kathir and stuff is translated, but a lot of stuff is not translated. A good Talib and a good Muslim in this age, in the time, in the age of uh, Skype and Zoom and whatnot, you must learn Arabic. If you learn Arabic, you find a lot of stuff and you will see and you will read books by Sunni scholars who have written in detail about the Ahl Bayt, alayhi wasalam. There are websites, for example, Mahajja, mahajja.com very good brothers from South Africa, they have written a lot of books about Ahl Bayt, about the merits, and uh, Al Hussein, of course, had children. As a matter of fact, um, Al Hussein had uh, uh, one son named Abu Bakr and one Umar, and they uh, they were martyred. They were killed at the Battle of Karbala. Of course, uh, the vast majority of Shias don't mention them. You see the rallies in Arba'in where they wave flags, Ya Hussein, Ya Abbas, uh, you will never hear Ya Abu Bakr ibn Ali. Ali's sons were all there. Ali had Uthman was there. Ali had sons Abu Bakr and Umar, um, and Hassan and Al Hussein, and all of them were present at Karbala, and they were and they were brave. And it's mentioned in their books. I'm not denying it's not in their books, but you see they're hesitant to mention these things openly because imagine, imagine a Shia, a young Shia person, hears in his uh, hears in his Husseinia shouting Ya. Yeah, Umar ibn al Hussein. <laughs> They're not gonna do this. I wrote articles about this. The 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 unknown, uh, the the forgotten, the forgotten martyrs of Karbala and so on. So yes, he had plenty of children amongst them: Abu Bakr, Umar, and I think Uthman as well. But if, as I said, if uh, inshallah, if you if you ask the brother, and then he reminds me, I can give you links, uh, where all his in English. I got the stuff. About all his children, how he named his children Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and so on. Not just Al Hussein, Al Hassan as well, and Ali as well. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, Abi Khaybar, he's next. He's gonna ask you in the voice call. Assalamu alaikum. I've got another question regarding regarding um, the incident of Mubahala. So the Shi'is, they use this and they say that the wives are excluded from the Ahlul Bayt. Because they were not <laughs> present. Can you answer this? Okay. Jazakallah. Yeah, I can answer this. First of all, um, brothers and sisters, the only religion that I'm aware of were the Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt means the people of a house. You know, in, in Arabic, 
even in modern day Arabic, if you go to an Arab person, especially Muslim person, obviously, you don't say, for example, how is your wife? It's considered rude. This is like, you see, Islam has deep influenced everything, including the language, of course. In the Arabic language, when you ask someone, it's not appropriate to say, how is your wife? You can't say, it's not nice. You say, how is your ahl? How is your ahl? It's more respectful. You know why? Because ahl, short of ahl bayt, means wives. In the Arabic language, ahl, ahl, ahl means wife. Ahlul Bay, the people of the house, which includes the husband, of course, but it's mainly like the wives and the children. The only religion I'm aware of, the only sect that excludes the wives of a man from his Ahlul Bayt, but includes his cousin and his 11 descendants from a Persian princess, is the Ravadi religion. Allah al now, I don't want to go into detail. We, again, we, we, we wrote tons of articles. I myself wrote articles about this, and we have videos about this explaining it. At least three times in the Quran, Allah addresses women as Ahl Bayt. Not just in this ayatul tathir, innama yuridullah, yuhiba ankum al Ahl Bayt. Not just there, that they, they, that first they cut in half anyway. They, they <laughs> look, they, they, their religion is based on. Decontextual, decontextualizing religious text, the Quran and Hadith. Because even the verse 33, 33, verse 33 of Surah Al Ahzab, yeah? Even that one, they show only one bit. The whole thing reveals it's about wives. So, verse 33, 33 is primarily about wives. Then the Prophet made dua, Hadith al Kisa, and they include it as a form of honor. Other verses in the Quran, they meant address wives as Ahl Bayt. The Arabic language, <laughs> wives are Ahl Bayt. Yet Shiism says, no, they're not Ahl Bayt. But his cousin is. No, maskara, absolute joke. As for Mubahala, why didn't the Prophet... So, wait a second, Mubahala, a Mubahala is a Mubahala is also called Mula'ana, as far as I know in Arabic. I.e., it's where you gather with your opponent and you invoke the curse of Allah on the on the side that is upon falsehood. So the Prophet ﷺ was ready to meet the heads of the Christians of Arabia, of Medina, to prove his prophethood. Of course, they were scared. They backed up. They didn't come. Because Muhammad al-Mustafa, al-Sadiq al-Amin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's a truthful, he's a true messenger of Allah. So they were scared to come. And the Prophet came with who? With his closest blood relatives. He came with his closest blood relatives. He did not have any children. So he came with his closest cousin, Ali bin Abi Talib, and his children. Now, this does not exclude the family, the other family of the Prophet. This is like, subhanAllah, this is like me being invited somewhere. And then I bring all my, I've got three children. I bring only my three children to that event. It's an important event. But I did not bring my wife. I only have four, uh, one wife. <laughs> Imagine I had four wives. Only a person who's deprived of, in, uh, of any intellect, he would then claim, oh, this means that uh, his wife are not his Ahl Bayt. Of course my wife is Ahl Bayt. I have never excluded them. So the Prophet Wasallam brought it because this was this was the rusum this was the uh, sorry this was the this was the tradition people brought the people closest to them from their family and blood relatives do you understand and they brought in there and the christians were scared and the prophet the prophet never claimed that therefore aisha is not ahl bayt and the shias as i said they decontextualize or they cherry pick narrations and verses of the Quran. In the same books of Ahlul Sunnah, you have narrations where the Prophet ﷺ visited every day his wives, or at the day he visited them and said salam to them and addressed them with Ahlul Bayt. Salamu alaikum ya Ahlul Bayt. 
and the plural form because you have to use the plural form even if they're women. Why? Just like Spanish language, a halbeit always includes a husband. So that's why you have to use the plural suffix. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al-bayt. They don't mention this narration. They don't mention the narration that after the incident of ifk, when the munafiqeen, munafiqoon, hypocrites of that time, accused Aisha of Aisha, a'udhu billah, when they accused her, radhi anhu, of what they have accused her, they don't mention that in the Sahih Hadith, the Prophet said, who can take revenge for me and my Ahlul Bayt, my wife? They don't mention this narration. So Mubahala has nothing to, Mubahala was a tradition where you need to invoke the curse of God, Allah on you if you're on falsehood. And the Christians were scared and they didn't even dare to face the Prophet. It has nothing to do with Khilafah. It has nothing to do with Khilafah. And it doesn't, it is a fallish, fallacious argument to argue that because the Prophet did not bring his wife, so the wives are now completely excluded from Ahl Bayt. This is nonsensical. You see, this is the extremism of Tashayyur, of Shiism. Something which is indeed a merit, indeed a virtue of Ahl Bayt that nobody denies, is beautiful, a beautiful narration, and we admit to it, and we say this is the lofty status of Ali bin Abi Talib and Hassan al Hussein and so on. They claim what? That they are the nafs of the Prophet in a literal sense. Ali ibn Abi Talib has all, all the qualities of the Prophet except prophethood. Nonsense. And then on top of it, they exclude their wives. Something that never Allah nor his messenger did. Alayhi yeah. salatu um, The next question will be from, inshallah, from Yahudi. Right. Hello. Uh, I have a quite, I have another question. Um, when it comes to the narrations of, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab burning on the house of uh, Fatima and Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? Um, and obviously the narrations are false, but um, I just want to know what are some of the names of like the earlier Shi'i scholars, right, who had rejected these narrations? All right. Early Shia scholars who rejected the narrations. I'm not aware of early Shia scholars who rejected the incident altogether. I'm not aware. By of rejecting the, uh, the 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 um, the broken rib ideal that she was beaten by like forty different people. I'm not aware that any of the early scholars rejected it. There is discussions about some of their own folks. They have debates amongst themselves. They claim that Al-Mufid did not affirm it, and then some of them claim that Al-Mufid affirmed the incident, but not details to it. And look, even amongst themselves, they know that they have, you know, over-exaggerated. They can't prove this incident from our books. And even from their own books, details of it are problematic. They have Kitab Sulaim bin Qais, and then they have discussions about the authenticity of Sulaim bin Qais and its narration. Some of them say it's completely fabricated, the whole book was narrated through a liar by a liar. Some of them say, no, some of the narrations are authentic or not. It's an absolute mess. For us, alhamdulillah, the, the issue is clear. And no, that's the answer. So that I'm not aware of any early scholar who completely rejected it. Why would they? You know, the, uh, this is the bread and butter. Yeah, the next question, inshallah. Um, the brother asked in the text channel, he says, what are the roots of uh, Madat Tashiyah do? Like, where can it be found in the time of Ali? Same thing with... Uh, what is the rule of what? The rule of what? Uh, but, um, what, Hello? So he, he asked, what are the roots of uh, Madat? So I think when they seek uh, Madat Tashiyah do, mm. like, where can it be found in the time of Ali? Same thing with uh, mm. the Kufr Aks. Mm. The root of seeking help from Ali, raising your hands and asking for medet. Medet means help, aid in Arabic. The roots are, uh, the address of this root, the roots are Iblis, Shaitan. This is the root. The root of Shirk lies in uh, evil and Shaitan, who misguides people. Sometimes he tells people to straight, yani, straight, forward frankly he tells people do something completely evil and they do it well, shaitan has obviously different ways once one needs to use his intellect and he will understand this some people shaitan misguides them by covering their evil deeds with what love love for albay 
love Jesus, they say. Call upon Jesus. Ask, our, ask your needs from Jesus. Jesus controls the universe. Now they might say, yeah, but we don't believe Ali is the son of God. Okay, what about the saints? I used to have a good friend. Still have a good friend. He used to be a Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. He said to me, before he became Muslim, he went to his uh, Russian church and then they had a day where the priest said, you know what, when you lose something, you ask this saint. And when you are hungry, you ask this saint. And for that, he said, I was, he said, I felt disgusted. It was, it was, it was, it was horrendous to believe. Alhamdulillah, his fitra was working. He said, I never considered Jesus. Alhamdulillah. His fitra was too sound to accept Imamism, Rafidism, where they constantly call upon saints. It's just their saints are not called Saint Gabriel and whatnot. Their saints are called Mahdi, Hassan, Hussein. Same thing, different names. So the root of the shirk, Ya Ali Madad Madad, Ya Hussein, Ya Mahdi Adrikni, Ya Fatima Zahra, Arithini, it's shirk and not tawassul. And tawassul, intercession, shafa'a, these are all fancy, legit, true Islamic concepts that are misused by Ahl Bidah. We believe in intercession. Every Sunni Muslim believes in intercession. Ibn Taymiyyah believes in intercession. The Wahhabis believe in intercession. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab believes in intercession. Intercession is for Yawm al Qiyamah. We have ahadith about this. It's for Yawm al Qiyamah. The Shuhada and the Anbiya, they might intercede for you. Yes. It's, it's called Islam. It's not called Christianity, Catholicism. Some people got Islam wrong with Catholicism. That's called Islam. We don't go around and raise our hands and say, Ya Saint Gabriel Madad, Ya Angel Jibreel Madad, Ya Ali Madad, Ya Fatima Madad, Ya Hussein Madad, Ya Qilal Madad, Ya Badawi Madad, and so on and so forth. The root of all of this is shaitan, evil. This is textbook paganism, textbook shirk, textbook polytheism. Um, and they have copied this really badly, this homework, from other pagans. And they have covered their evil deeds and their evil beliefs and practices and rituals. They have covered it for themselves and the gullible with what? Love of Ahl Bayt. But we love Ahl Bayt. We love Ali. Ali. Ali bin Abi Talib only called upon Allah alone. Ali said, Ya Allah. I love Ali. I say like Ali. Ya Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ida sa'alta fas'alillah. Ali is sahih. The Prophet said to Ibn Abbas, If you ask, you only ask Allah. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ This is Tawheed. This is Islam. This is Sunni Islam. Now, of course, we have people who have no shame. And they come with pathetic spoofs. Not proofs. Spoofs. They say things like, Don't you ask your friend for a glass of water? <laughs> don't you go to the doctor? Yes, my friend, I do go to a doctor. But I don't go to the local cemetery and say, Oh, yo, doctor. I need my um, anti, um, I don't know, I need my tablets for so-and-so. I do ask my wife or my daughter, can I, or my son, can I have a glass of water? Can you give me a glass of water? This is in matters of, in this worldly thing where we ask people, we don't make dua for them. They compare these matters where, where you ask someone next to you or on the phone with calling like you see, this is all from this is all from Satanism, calling upon spirits. They compare this to calling upon souls, raising your hands, believing that Ali bin Abi Talib or Jesus Christ or that Maryam or Fatima can hear billions in different accents. Forget forget my languages, different accents, different time. And Ali bin Abi Talib is 24 hours opened. Hello Ali, I need this. Ali, I need this. He doesn't sleep. Yani, like Allah. You can call Allah anytime because Allah is different from human beings. Allah doesn't sleep. His nature is different from us. He is a Samir, the all hearing. He hears everything. He is Al Basir, the all hearing. He's Al Alim, the all knowing. He's Al Mujib, the one who answers. The Shia, the Ravada, and other polytheists, they might not call their saints as Samir, Al Basir. Al Mujib, Al Alim. So what? You don't need to call something literally something in order to turn it to God. 
Subhanallah, sometimes, you know, I have this problem with Shias. They say, but we don't call Ali a God. But you treat him like one. In your mu'amala, in your, in your interaction, in your actions, you treat him like a God. You raise your hands and pray to him. And then shamelessly state, I should say predominantly the scholars, you know, that this is just intercession. Tawassul. This is not tawassul. There is Islamic tawassul. I show you Islamic tawassul. Oh Allah, uh, by your rahmah forgive me. I made now, I made now tawassul bi asma al husna, with the beautiful names of Allah. Oh, Ya Allah, by my love for Muhammad wasalam, forgive me. By my love for him. I'm not calling upon the Prophet. I'm not asking him anything. This is tawassul through by my love of the Prophet. I'm not praying to him. I'm not praying to Jesus, to Mary, to Saint X, Y, Z, Ali, Badawi, Jilani, any saint, any peer. This is Tawheed. And then they bring these shallow and fallacious analogies like drinking water or if you are drowning, would you not ask anyone for help? They compare this to their literal dua to other than Allah. So in a nutshell, the root of this zandaqa, heresy, and textbook shirk is Iblis. It's pure evil. It's shirk. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, did not fight did not come and preach for 23 years to tell people don't call upon Hobal, don't call upon the saints of the Quraysh. Some of them were righteous men. Don't call upon Mary and Jesus. Some, and at this time, there were Arab Christians in Arabia, even in Medina. He did not come to say to the people, don't call upon Mary and Jesus and Jibreel and the saints of the Quraysh and idols. Yes, some things were literally like just plain idols. And now come and replace them with myself and Ali and Hassan and Hussein and call upon them for uh, needs. Only someone with no intellect or an evil person who knows the truth would claim so. The Prophet came to single out Allah and worship. And the highest form of worship is salah and dua. Anybody in the world, if you show a Hindu, a Muslim does this, the person will say he's praying. He's involved in worship. So in worship, we call upon none other than Allah. We pray for other people. Like when I say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, I'm praying for Prophet Muhammad. When I say salamu alaikum, is itself a dua. But we don't pray to them. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Um, the next question, the next question um, is from Boogeyman. Aida? Yeah, I'll start now. Are you here? Yeah. Hello. Uh, do you want a question about Tahrif or do you want a question about Ridda? Ridda to Sahaba? Ridda. Ridda. So this is a logical question. Um, and we have some rather Shias here. Okay. Now, the Shias claim that the companions, Radha Allah Anhum, they, did, they made Ridda after the death of the Prophet mm -hmm. Now, the question is, were the Sahaba Shia, Ithna Ashariya, during the time of the Prophet and then they became Sunnah after his death, or were they Sunnis before his death, and then they became Shia after his death? <laughs> we have some Shia brothers here. I want you to think about it, and inshallah, the list that can maybe have answered this. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Because what does Aridda mean? Aridda means, it's a translated in English uh, to apostatize. They became apostates. They left the fold of Islam. Why? Why did they claim? Pay attention. If, if one were to follow the batil, the false, heretical narrative of the twelve words, then yes, it makes sense. It's a horrendous belief. I wouldn't even consider Islam. Go to a non-Muslim and say, "Yeah, oh, no, more Sahaba than Kufan." MashaAllah, 23 years of da'wah and you know, most of the Sahaba became kuffar, his clothes wives became kuffar, a'udhu billah. What kind of prophet is this? But their belief, if one were to follow the belief, as I mentioned, says, well, they rejected veloyat. You know, the superstition called wilaya of Ali bin al When I say superstition, I mean their understanding of wilaya, of course. Ali bin Abi Talib is our Mawla in the way that the Prophet called him. He has haq over us. 
and we support him and we love him. This is exactly how the Sahaba understood Ghadir, by the way. And even Ahl Bayt understood Ghadir. Remember, www.ghadirkhum.com, the website by Brother Farid. The website by Sunni Defense, 12 Shia, he was part of our team. So remember, the Sahaba and Ahl Bayt understood it correctly. That uh, wilaya of Ali as in walaya as in giving Nusra support, aiding Ali, loving Ali as a close ally, not just friend. Now they believe that the Sahaba rejected what they have. Mm, they believe that the Sahaba rejected what they have introduced as not just asl deen, the foundation of the deen, but the asl of all usul. Because you have to understand, according to Twelvers, wilaya of Ali bin Abi Talib and Imama is not just Asl al-Din, it's the usul of all deen. Everything revolves around that. So if you have such an over-exaggerated belief, hmm, then of course you're going to reject and make takfir on anybody who did not accept this main belief. That's why the scholars like Mufid and Majlisi and so on, I think yeah, Mufid said it, that rejecting one Imam, one, it's like rejecting a prophet. All prophets, or one prophet, or all prophets, the same. They only differ in takfir. And many people don't know this. They don't doubt that we are kuffar. The, the vast majority of the modern day and the past 12 of Scott believe that we are kuffar. The only difference is are we kuffar in this world or in the next? In the next, if you come before Wilaya, you're 100% kafir. Except very few exceptions. They call them Mustafa Afin. People who have been overpowered, miskeens. Like, it's their form of other bil Excuse of ignorance. They have some exceptions. The asl is, if you come, Yom Al-Qiyamah, we thought wilaya, this nonsense that they invented and they can't prove from Quran or Sunnah, then you're kafir. But as the Prophet said, if these Sahaba became kafir before that, so they believed in wilaya or what? Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that these Sahaba believed in wilaya and in 12 Imams and Isma infallibility? Of course, there's no such evidence. No. Is many questions still left? Yeah, we've got some more questions, inshallah. Um, okay, the... go on. One more. The next question will be from uh, uh, from uh, Muhammad Azam. Are you there, Muhammad Azam? Can you speak now, Muhammad Azam? Assalamu alaikum. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, my question is regarding the, <clears throat> the so some some Shia believe regarding the uh, the idea of the Harif al Quran. But at the same time, there are quite a lot of Shias who don't believe that. But even they sort of have this uh, belief that you know Ali radhiAllahu anhu had his own compilation of the Quran, which was in uh, chronological order, and it had the Tafsir as well. So even if if they believe that, how is that not in itself a kind of Tahrif? Because if that's a form of tahrir. yeah, so what what is the so the ones that say that we believe that the Quran is preserved today, but they also believe mm -hmm. that uh, Ali radhiAllahu mm -hmm. had his own copy with uh, with the with the mm -hmm. Quran in chronological order. Mm -hmm. So w w how do they like, square this circle? Okay, first allow me to say in defense of Shias. Now I'm I'm defending them, and I sometimes do this. Because there is misconceptions that Sunnis have. First of all, most religious, uh, most Shias are not religious anyway. As you know, I always repeat this. It's actually known, yeah? It's pretty obvious. Most Shias are Iranians and most Iranians are very irreligious, borderline agnostic people. But even the religious ones, who are mainly Arab and subcontinent Shias, and some Iranians, even they, from my experience, my personal experience, and I used to be Shia, the majority of them, they love the Quran. They love it. They try to read it. And they don't hold tahrif beliefs. At least, they don't believe that what they believe is tahrif. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying this is 100% excused, excusable. It's an excusable stance. Stance. I'm not saying this. But I'm saying this is from their view, viewpoint. So we should not be too harsh, especially not with layman Shias. To go to them and call them, hey, you kafir, all of you believe in tahrif. Not saying that you do that, Baba. I'm, this is general advice. On the topic of tahrif, especially, generally, I know I'm someone I'm known for my sharp tongue and I'm harsh sometimes by myself, but I remind myself and all of you 
We should be as calm as possible and be careful of accusations. So generally, they don't believe in Tahrir and they love the Quran. My grandmother, who's still alive, one of my grandmothers passed away a few months ago and she left all shirk. May Allah, what I'm aware of, may Allah have mercy on her. The grandmother, from my father's side, who's still alive, she is Shia and she reads every day the Quran. It doesn't believe in Tahrir. And my grandmother is not a hujjah, it's not a divine evidence now, <laughs> but I'm just saying many are like this. From my experience, can you please mute yourself, brother? Can you please mute yourself? From my experience, from my experience, is the majority of Shias are like this. Now you question, I needed to do this introduction in defense of them. Now you question, isn't it tahrif itself? Forget about their, your example, brother. Even absurd interpretations of the Quran are regarded as tahrif. The scholars of Islam mention this. The ulama mention if someone brings a batini, batini, you know this esoteric type of tafsir, you know, we, we're not denying that the Quran has in a way layers as in there's, there is, you can derive many things from a text. Ahlul Sunnah never deny this. Ahlul Sunnah deny batini tafsir, esoteric tafsir. I repeat, Ahl Sunnah agree that from a verse, from a surah, you can derive a lot of things from this angle and that angle. But the Baltaniya, the esoteric groups and sects among the mother Rafidah, they have a Baltani approach to the Quran. Like, you know, the famous, for example, the 12 Imams are the 12 Imams, they say. Do you know that? And in Fashilin, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a failed sect. They can't prove imama. It's clearly, if you see the tafasir, because they can't prove imama clearly, they come with stuff, the number games. Like, if you know, esoteric groups and people, they have this thing with numbers. They say, oh, look, 12 worms in the Quran. 12 imams. Oh, uh, they say that, um, a teeny was zaytun, the fig and the zaytun, olive, is for Hassan Hussein. And this animal here in cow, Surah Baqarah, stands for and this animal and this this and that's that's for Abu Bakr and Umar. This itself, brother, is tahrif. That's also tahrif. Because what does tahrif mean? A lughatan, lugha based yani lughatan, lughawiyan, based on the lugha. Tahrif means distortion in Arabic. So you distort something. It's clear distortion, you don't have an excuse. So that itself is tahrif. But again, in defense of most Shias, I personally believe. Most Shias Akhi don't know these things. They don't, they Akhi, they, they have been brought up, the religious ones, to be obsessed with Bukhari Muslim. They don't even know their own books. They know, know, don't know how horrendous and kufri and embarrassing really their main books of Tafsir are. Why do you think they don't translate their main books of Tafsir? I know they have translated partially Tafsir Qummi. Maybe they have finished translating all of it, but it took a lot of time and they're still very reluctant. And Iran has the money to translate all their books in a week. Why don't they do it? Because Tafsir Al Qummi, Tafsir Al Ayashi, the Tafsir by these Kufar and Zanadra is full of Kufr, full of Tahrif al Quran, full of insults in Takfir against Sahaba, full of Batani, ridiculous Tafsir. If any aqil person of intellect would read this, he would run away from Tashayya. He would rather um, rather uh, choose, he would rather choose Hinduism than Shiaism. That's why, why do you think they are reluctant to um, translate the Tafasir? Whereas look at Ahl Sunnah. When I moved to the UK in 2008, there was already Tabari and uh, parts of Tabari and Tafsir Ibn Kathir ready translated in English. Uh, many parts of it. Why? Because it's a beautiful tafsir, logical, based on Quran, hadith, no botany tafsir, praise of Ahl Bayt, praise of Sahaba. They don't have this, brother. So, yes, even false interpretation, um, absurd trans uh, interpretations, a tahrif, not any mistake in uh, interpretation, but these absurd ones, botany ones, that's tahrif. And yes, as you mentioned, it is a mainstream belief that Ali went with his copy of the Quran to Abu Bakr and Umar that includes a divine tafsir and presented it to them. And they said, we don't want it. And then Ali, astaghfirullah, they portray him like, have you seen these little girls on the playground or boys? They say to them, okay, and now I don't want to play with you. 
And I said, okay, sorry, can we play? And I said, no, I never want to play with you. They portray Ali like a little spoiled girl or boy who came with the Quran to Abu Bakr and Umar and said to them, uh, here is the Quran with the so-called divine tafsir. And then Ali, Abu Bakr and Umar said, no, no need of that. And then later Abu Bakr and Umar said, uh, came back to him and said, can we have a look? Can we have it? He said, no, you're never going to see it until Qiyamah. One of my progeny, my descendants will come of it, i.e. the, the Qa'im, according to them, their Mahdi, which is a ridiculous belief. So they believe that right now on this earth, a man is roaming the earth who himself is already infallible and who has a divine tafsir, divine interpretation of the Quran, the real Quran with its real interpretation. How, and what need is this man who is infallible, who is a walking Quran, according to them, of a divine book? with divine tafsir. We are in need of it. Or at least their own jama'ah, their own sect. So you see from every angle a absolute foolish belief and a form of tahrif. However, even in this regards, I say, many Shia are not aware of this belief. Now. Jazakallah khair. Um, the next yeah, yeah. question is, is, is quite, uh, it's in relation to this, what you mentioned about tahrif. Um, the brother asked in the text channel, he says, uh, what do they believe about the Quran preservation and uh, what, and uh, what's their position in, reg in regards to Qirat? And yeah, so that's that's the question. And the, the next question okay, would be... Very... Uh, now, well, let me first answer this because I'm going to forget the next one. Let me quickly answer this. Uh, most Shia people, as I said, even the religious ones, they love the Quran, they read the Quran, they don't believe in Tahrif. That's not my personal experience, at least. And uh, what about Qiraat? They don't believe in Qur'at, according to the, which is ridiculous, because that's again a form of tahrif, but most of the laymen don't understand these things. They have attributed fabrications to the Ahl Bayt, the Imams of Ahl Bayt, like Jafar al-Sadiq, who said, I wrote articles about this, who said that they have lied, the Sunnis have lied. The Qur'an wasn't revealed in seven Ahruf, it was revealed by one Lord in one Harf, in one, in one Harf. These are fabrications that go against reality. Believing in so means you believe in tahrif because what are all these other, what are all these other qiraat then? Tahrif or what? And which one of these is correct? Which one? So uh, qiraat is a reality, it's all from Allah. Ahruf is a reality, it's all from Allah, the seven ahruf. Uh, they don't believe in ahruf. And uh, all of the scholars, all of the scholars, not the laymen, but all of the scholars in one form or another believe in proper tahrif. Some of the scholars say literally um, verses added and removed, and the other ones say it's naqis, uh, billah. The scholars mentioned this. They say that this Quran, even this Allatiyari, this Kafir Shaitan, the modern day speakers, they say stuff like this. They say this Quran is naqis. Naqis means the fact. But it's muhtaram. That's the answer to all these Shias. Have you seen the speakers when they always say, come here, come to Qom, come to Iran, come to Karbala. Look, we have the same Quran as you. Yeah, what do you want? You want a cookie from us? You want a cake? You want to print a new one or was it? We didn't expect from you to print a new one. When Ahl Sunnah say they believe in Tahrif, we don't mean that they printed new ones. We believe what they believe, what is in the books. They state that the current Quran is naqis, defect, but muhtaram, respected. Muhtaram as in, it's all we have and according to the narrations, the Imams, a'udhu billah, kufr fawqa, kufr fawqa, kufr attributed to the Imams. They have attributed lies to the Ahl Bayt, that the Ahl Bayt, the Imams of Ahl Bayt said, Jafar al-Sadiq and Imam Baqir, that act upon this Quran until the Qa'im comes, the so-called Mahdi. Act upon this naqis, Quran that is defect, because it's good enough to act upon it. This is the understanding of the most of the scholars, that this Quran in one way or another is naqis effect at the very least the divine tafsir is not with us or we have to act upon it until the qa'im comes but most shia laymen don't believe in this but i myself i have a website called shiascans.com and a website myself and other brothers and i have a section about tahrif and what is helpful is to show shia people that it's not going to help you to bring this narration, flimsy narration that Umar read al Fatiha like this of Fulan Sahabi. These can all be answered by Sunnis. These are all shav narrations, flimsy narrations that can be explained with Ahruf. You guys, on the other hand, your top scholars, bigger than the likes of Dhabi and Al Albani and whatnot, they said things like believing in Tahrif is a logical necessity, like the Kafir and Zindiq Bakr and Majlisi. 
whom they have dedicated a shrine, a shrine, to, they make ziyara. They go on pilgrimage to the shrine of this Kafir Muhammad Baqar al Majlisi, who is there buried in Iran, who is the top muhaddith of the 16th century, who said that believing in Tahrif is a logical necessity. It is mass transmitted by in our books. And it's a logical necessity because who transmitted the Quran? The majority of the Sahaba. Who are they? They are kuffar to us, yes. So of course the Quran can't be 100% correct. But we practice upon the Quran and we believe in it. It's defect, they say, a'udhu billah, but better than nothing. And when the Qa'im comes, when our 12th one comes, then we're going to act upon the real Quran. This is something, these are delicate information and details that they, 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 they normally don't share. They never share when they bring like one-liners like, oh, no, we don't believe in Tahrif. Look, we have the same book. Now, I hope it's clear. Yeah, that's clear. JazakAllah khair. Um, oh, yeah. The next question uh, brother asked in the text, John, he says, what groups of uh, or, or sects of Shia should be takfir other than the Ismailis, uh, al Alawis, and Alvi? Yes. Nusairis, um, Nusairis, and the Nusairis, they don't call themselves Nusaydis. I hope you know that. In Syria, they call themselves Alawi. It's extreme. Any All, all Shia groups are Batani influence. Some are more Batani, esoteric. Some are less. For example, Twelveism is a Batani sect. Their tafasir is full of Bataniya and Kufr and Zandaqa. However, Alawism, it's even more Batani. And there's even more Kufr in their religion. Uh, first and foremost, we shouldn't call them Batani from a Muslim point of view because uh, we shouldn't call them Alawi from a Muslim point of view because Alawi means people who are upon Ali's path, right? Alawi. Just like uh, Ahmadi. Ahmadi are people upon Ahmad, Muhammad's Wasallam path. They are not Ahmadis to us. We call them Qadianis. Not as an insult, just because to avoid to call them Ahmadis. Their, their leader was born in Qadian. So we call the Alawis, we call them Nusaydis based on the, their founder. And we should refrain from calling them Alawis. And Alawis are Bataniya. Yeah, and uh, in, in, in Turkey, there's many of them as well. They call themselves Alevi, like in Turkish language. Very similar. They have like different, amongst the Alevis, they have like different sects and subgroups. Overall, they are similar. They do believe in 12 Imams, by the way. They do believe in 12 Imams. They are basically like, they are 12 us really without the Sharia element of like Salat and Psalm and so on. Even Salat, they have their own form of Salat, singing, sitting, playing guitar, mixed gatherings. They have their own form of fasting. I, I met, for example, one Alawi, uh, Saidi, he, he fasts the first 10 days of Muharram. Now, and here's the very interesting thing. I remember in Germany, there was uh, this website, major websites, representatives of Alawis, they even rejected to be called Muslims. They said, we don't call ourselves Muslims. We are Alawis, that's it. We are our own thing. So some of them openly say they are not Muslims. But in all fairness, some of them claim Islam. I met Alawis who do claim Islam. Anyway, from a traditional Sunni position, Alawism is pure Zandar and Kufr. These people are not Muslims, without a shred of doubt. These people are 100% not Muslims. And many of them don't even attribute to Islam. And um, 12ism, Shiism, as I said, Shiism is a two- broad term it's an umbrella term and 12ism you might find people and uh, reformists i'm in contact with 12 reformists they still have hold some bit i believes and wrong beliefs but they left all the shirk belief all the kufr belief we can't make takfir on these people we can't make takfir on all 12 or say 12 was a kufar all of them and it's not your obligation to make takfir on people it's you know yes you need to understand what is kufr and shirk when you see that something is clearly kufr and shirk, you abstain from it and you warn people against it. But for specific individuals, you know, you shouldn't rush with takfir and should uh, leave the matter to people of knowledge, the individual case. The general case, yes, we can speak generally. We can say any Sunni or any Shia. doesn't matter what you call yourself. You can call yourself Muslim Salafi, on 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 you can call yourself muslim salafi on on what do you call it on steroids any muslim salafi on steroids who curses the sahaba says all the sahaba kuffar and he prays to abu Bakr and umar he prays to them 
or praise to Ali. This is shirk. He's not a Muslim. He's not a Muwahid. He's not a monotheist. You know? So it has nothing to do with the person being a, calling himself a Shi'i or Sunni. Anybody who does this kufr, major kufr deeds, yeah, that are unexcusable. Unexcusable. There's some kufr deeds, of course, they're excusable. You know? And some scholars say some forms of shirk are excusable under certain circumstances for specific individuals. But generally speaking, it's allowed to speak in general terms. This is the tradition of Al-Sunnah. For example, when the scholars say, whoever prays to other Allah, Allah is a mushrik. This is a specific, this is a general statement. And then there's a specific, there could be specific cases. Yeah. But calling all, calling all Shias or Kuffar is 100% wrong. 100% wrong. Because amongst them, as I mentioned earlier, are Muslims, definitely. Jazakallah khair. Um, the next question oh, yeah. from uh, Boogeyman. Aida? I'm here. Uh, yeah, Astana, I have a question, and this is a very wide question, yani, it's not a specific one. But we, when we were talking about the harif, okay, and you, we can mention so many scholars that believe in the tahrif, all the other stuff, okay, like that we are all the other stuff. Why don't the, this maraja today, is, why don't they call out the scholars who believe in tahrif? Like Kamal Haider, he said, there is thousands of hadiths of, of these scholars that believe in tahrif and they support it. Tosi, Saduq, all the, you know, the scholars, I don't need to mention them. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Why don't they call out? Why, do, why, do, why don't the Sistani go and, and, and give it? Exactly. Yeah, Tosi is a kafir because he believes in tahrif. Why do they do that? Easy. Easy. And it's very easy. too, you know, like everything. Very easy. If uh, Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah believe that anybody who believes in uh, Tahrif is a kafir, and the Rafa can't believe this. They claim they have hub, love for Thaqalain, Quran and Itra. Yeah, they claim they have love for Quran and Itra. As for the Itra, Ahl Bayt, they claim that he is in major occultation. He, he doesn't guide no one and nothing. Last time he was seen in a Sardab in Samarra. And they even, you know, they do ziyara. They have a kufr ritual, paganism, pure paganism in the name of al -Bayt, Where even one of their people, uh, this uh, Hassan Qadri, he went, they went down the stairs. They do ziyara to a basement, to a cellar in Samarra, which hilariously is 99.9% .9 Sunni city in northern Iraq. Where uh, Imam al-Hadi is buried. One of the Imams of al -Bayt, has nothing to do, never claimed to be a 12 never claimed to be infallible. And uh, Imam Askari is buried there, his son. And they claim that the last time the 12th Imam was seen there. And they do ziyara, pilgrimage. They go down and invoke him, pray to him. Not that they literally believe he's in there. This is a misconception, some Sunni say. But he was seen last time there. And they venerate a sirdab, a basement, this zanadiqa. May Allah guide them, especially the... The layman, because Wallahi, we wish nothing but guidance and good for the layman Shia people. They are victims of the Shia of Imam Zid. So yes, as, as you said, brother, um, why don't they make takfir? Because then they would have no religion left. All the religion would collapse. Forget about Tusi. You know, some people doubt Tusi. Stick to the clear ones, the ones, the clear cut matter, the ones like Kulaini the Zindiq. Ali bin Ibrahim is the teacher of Kulaini, the Zindiq. He, they both believed in Tahrif. The Safawi scholars, Bakr al-Majlisi, Ni'matullah al-Jazairi, all of them believed in Tahrif. Oh, major, proper Tahrif. Yani they openly, they said stuff like, who it's, it logic dictates to believe Tahrif. In Tahrif, a'udhu billah. The Sahaba with Kuffar, a'udhu billah, so we believe in Tahrif because they narrated the Quran, transmitted the Quran, they believe, a'udhu billah. Some of the scholars say, "Is it? It's all on my web. You can go on my website on our website, shiascans.com." Some of the scholars say, "Is is it's one of the daruriyat, daruriyat of the madhab, is one of the necessities of the madhab." Of course, many Sunni scholars and activists and tulab say any Rafi authority who claims otherwise is doing taqiyya. And you mentioned Kamal Al Haydari, Ahsan, Kamal Al Haydari. <laughs> he raised this question to his own people. He said, we have more... Kamal al-Haydari said, and uh, I translated this 
video. It's on my YouTube channel, Ibn Hussein. Kamal al-Haydari said, we, the Twelvers, have more narrations in support of the distortion of the Quran than we have narrations in support of Imama. Look what shaitanic, what satanic, what evil sect, or shall I say, religion it is. A religion that is anyway has exaggerated with imams and is imam centric and it's mainly focused on the cousin of the Prophet Ali, Ali bin Abi Talib anhu, Prophet. but although they are mainly focused on him and his descendants from a Persian princess when it comes to tahrif al-Quran the distortion of the Quran by the evil sahaba as they call it they have more narrations in support of that belief than about imam and these are not my words these are the words of Kamal al-Haydari so of course the scholars claimed uh, Tawatur. And you know what's funny? Those among them who want to weaken the statement or want to refute the statement of Kamal al-Haydari say, you know what, he's mistaken, what Tawatur, uh, we have to analyze each narration. These are the same people who say that uh, Kasr al -Dala, the breaking, the breaking of the ribs of Fatima, it's, it's proven by Tawatur in our books, they say. They say that even if chains are weak in our books, in their 12 books, altogether if you take it, it's a established... Uh, Incident, at least according to us, twelve us. Ah, suddenly there they argue with Tawatur. Tawatur bil ma'ana. Yeah, Tawatur bil ma'ana. Atayyib, you have over thousand narrations in support of the blatant tahrif of the Quran attributed kufr and zandaka to the Ahl bayt Something no sect, no matter, no evil. The worst of the Khawarij haven't invented such lies and attributed it to anyone, anybody, let alone the Ahl bayt so how are you going to reconcile this? And as you know, Kamal al-Haydari said at least 200 of these narrations have solid chains of narrations. as sahih yani muwathaq and whatnot, authentic according to their standards. So actually, the reason they can't make takfir is because their religion would be gone. Whereas we make takfir whoever does not believe in the Quran. What do they do? Remember this one, this Zindiq, this Shubeli, the turban had from this Fadak Rafada Ork organization. Oh, he used to be from them anyway. One of the English speaking ones, he made once a lecture, and I knew he's going to break the uh, because they normally do this. He brought up an Egyptian, apparently a sheikh from um, Azhar in Egypt, Cairo, who believed in the distortion of the Quran at the beginning of the 20th century, 19 something. I did research, and guess what? He was a Zindir Kafir who all the scholars of Azhar kicked him out and made takfir on this. Many among them Sufi scholars, like Ash'ari type of scholars and Azhar, predominantly Asla. This is, this is look, the generality, the, the general people and the scholars of Al-Sunnah. When I say generally Al-Sunnah, as Imam Al-Albani Ibn Taymiyyah explained, all the people who ascribe to Al-Sunnah who are not Twelvers, they are Al-Sunnah. For example, the Sha'ira and the Salafi Atharis are all Al-Sunnah in regards to Sahaba, for example, and many issues. So this Zindiq Shubedi, this Jahil, what did he bring? He said, oh yeah, look, uh, this Egyptian guy also believed in Tahrir. Although some Zindiq Kafir, we declare takfir on him. Do you declare tak takfir on uh, uh, Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi, the Zindiq? On Ni'matullah al-Jazari, the Zindiq? On uh, Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi, the Zindiq? On, on, on uh, uh, Kulaini, uh, the Zindiq? Of course they don't, because their religion would be vanished if they do this. But anyway, it's, we don't need that to do that. We translate the works of 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 <laughs> of uh, what's his name here of Haidari, we translate the clear cut statements of the scholars and the people with intellect, truth seeking, uh, twelve us, and Ahl Sunnah they will understand that this religion twelveism is based on Tahrif al Quran in one way or another. However, they want to, however they want to, you want to look at it at, from what angle. However you want to move it, in one way or another they believe it's a necessity in the sect. Because they can't prove their main principle of the Qur'an. Of course they have to believe in this Zandaqa. Yeah, go on. JazakAllah Khair. The next question uh, the brother asked, he said, you said calling all Shia kuffar is wrong. However, the scholars are in unanimous agreement that the Qur'an is not the evocal word of Allah, but rather creation. If they do not fall under this aqidah, wouldn't the um, he says, wouldn't the no longer fall under the understanding of a Shia and would have a severely rejected Ishtihad amongst the Shia and as such renders them in cons consideration outside of the sect 
and as such the term was uh, was still applied um i asked this question in consideration of the understanding of ibn hazm others of the like yes first of all ibn hazm rahmatullah alayhi we don't have infallible imams all our imams all the scholars made mistakes all the scholars uh even sahaba made mistakes we have no infallible imams what Ibn Hazm says is generally correct, of course. He's a scholar and I'm not. I'm just sad that, and even you just said, I don't think the brother thought it through because he said, yeah, if the scholars believe, but I said not all of them believe. First of all, all of them don't know, most of them don't even know what the scholars say. Most of them pray, you know, they dislike Sahaba more or less. Some of them curse, some of them don't. We don't, we can't make blanket takfir on the 12 of us. Can't say all of them are kufar just like that. This is not the solution. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying this out of taqiyya or fear or you know to sugarcoat anything. I'm the last person to be scared of these people. People know me. I'm very frank when it comes to these issues. I say what is in my chest, with my chest out. I say this because I believe so. There is no pragmatical, there is no practical uh, benefit. There's no not just benefit. It's just plainly wrong. It's Islamically wrong to say all Shias and even all travels are blanket takfir. It's wrong. It takes us to nowhere. It will lead to bloodshed. It is wrong. Um, there's many Shias, as I mentioned. There are uh, reformists among them. There's a blog on my website, I, on my own blog, Ibn Hussein. You see, I'm, I told you, I'm involved in many websites and blogs. Ibn Hussein, um, 1424 at what dot. Anyway, Ibn Hussein blog. <laughs> There I have linked a, a, a another blog. It's called Shia Reformist. This is by a brother, but the articles were written by a group of brothers, mainly from the UK, um, former Twelvers, uh, or among them Twelvers who have left a lot of bid'ah and a lot of shirk. There's a lot of reformists among them who forget about not believing uh, in Tahrif al-Quran. They, they don't even call upon Ali and stuff like that. So we have to be, uh, as much as we can, soft in our approach not harsh and uh, even the scholars when i said that all of them believe in one way or another in the tahrif of course they have their weird ta'wilat they have their weird interpretations they read the quran they believe in it of course in the end of the day is a form of tahrif but for a second forget about the scholars they are not the majority of the 12 ones they are a tiny minority the vast majority of their people do not believe in tahrif the vast majority of the 12 ones Religious people respect the Quran. They, my parents, at least my, for my, my mother still, and in Iran, my family and other sh people I know, they are Shias and they love the Quran, they respect it. They have no clue about these details that I have shared with you guys. Most of them don't know. This is my observation. And my advice would be for you that, um, yes, this is kufr if someone holds this, if it's 100% for you clear that someone else is believed then yes this kufr akbar yes the shirk akbar yes but blanket statement that you know all of them believe this i didn't say this i said all of them believe in one way or another in forms of tahrif and there's different degrees of tahrif some forms of tahrif are uh for example it's when you make it wrong batani tafsir this is a form of uh dalala this misguidance was not kufr some forms of tahrif are kufr. Like when someone says this was added to the Quran, removed. You see, as I mentioned at the beginning, Ahlul Sunnah stand out from Ahlul Bid'ah because we have tafsil in the matters. Tafsil, details to the matters. To everything, there's detail. In the matter of takfir, there is details to it. It's not black and white. In the matter of tabdi' calling someone a mubtadi', there is details to it. It's not black and white, like some extremist groups. You all know them. Go and expel someone from Ahl Sunnah because he sits with them or talks to them or is with me. You understand? No. Khair. Um, the next question: um, they, uh, Do they have like a sanad for the Quran, uh, like a sanad chain that goes back to the Prophet? A good question. No, they don't have a senate. They they play dirty games, unfortunately. When I say they, again, nobody should get offended. I'm really, I'm generally not talking to you, the Shia person who is listening. Wallahi, to me, I'm not saying it in an arrogant way that you're a victim. I know you guys love Ahl Bayt. 
and may Allah guide you and us to the truth and may Allah accept your love for Ahlul Bayt but I say this as I said without arrogance most Shias are victims of the Shayu they don't know these things and they get fooled they get tricked by their speakers and by these Mu'ammameen by these turban heads most of them are really evil people Zanadiqa, Mushrikun, Kufar, 100% who instead of guiding the people to Tawheed and, and purifying the ranks from Shirk and Bid'ah and over-exaggeration over -exaggeration with Ahl Bayt and making people focus on Allah and Salah and Dua and, and Dua primarily of course and Salah they do pray to Allah although they have some Shirk Salah like Salat Isra'at al Fatim al Zahra and Imam al Zaman but anyway to make their own people focus on praying to Allah alone they turn the people more and more away from Tawheed and into shirk and grave worship and grave visitation and pilgrimages to this tomb and that tomb and that shrine and that shrine. So most of them, Akhi, my brother, uh, they don't know about this. They don't know that in Tashayyu, they don't have a sanat to the Quran. Yani these 12 infallible Imams have not written one book. Now they will come up with excuses. Oh, they were oppressed, this and this. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam was oppressed. Ibrahim was thrown into the fire. Uh, Yunus was thrown into the whale, the belly of the whale. All of them, in the end of the day, Allah supported them and made them, made them superior to the enemies. They, Allah overpowered. Allah made them, Allah made them victorious over the prophets. Tayyip, how can they always come with this excuse that oh, Ali was overpowered, Jafar al was overpowered? That's why they wrote no books. If they were true infallible imams and they had the true guidance, where is the book? Where is the Quran? To, written by Jafar al-Sadiq. Where's the Senate at least? Where's the Senate by the Imams, the 12 ones? They don't have it. And you know what dirty game and trick they play? I've seen it, they translate, they in I've seen it in various languages, in the four languages that I know. They play the same game. They bring, for example, Hafs and Asim. And then they mention that Hafs is a Shi'i. And now I hope all of you know what it means. If you look then, the Tarjama, the biography of Hafs, he is considered a Shi'i, a Shi'a of that time, the early, early, early ones, who are basically, they are like uh, Sunnis. They are Sunnis who had some leanings uh, towards Tashayyu and um, nothing to do with Twelverism, but some Shi'i leanings, as I mentioned back then, where if you were too critical or openly critical about, for example, Uthman or Muawiyah and stuff like that. So he is not a 12, uh, nothing to do with them. According to the standards, he's, he's Aslan a Kafir. Because he doesn't believe in 12 Imams. He's at the very least misguided according to them. But what do they do? They play these oh, like cheap games. And they bring Hafs and Asim and they say, oh, look at this guy. Uh, Fulan Sunni Sheikh said, uh, he's a Shia. They don't mention what does that mean, that he is, has, is not a 12 uh, and they play the same game with some other Qiraat. And that's what they do. In reality, in a nutshell, they don't have a Sanat of the Quran. They must have the claims to the Quran and Itra. The Itra, the Ahl Bayt, is somewhere in Sardab, guiding nobody. And the Quran, the real one with the real Tafsir, is with an infallible guide, so called infallible guide, who's guiding no one, who was last seen in the Sardab. And uh, mashallah, this is what they claim to be superior. To Madhab and to Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, Ahl Sunnah al Abrar. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like a joke, but this, this, is, this, is, this is the reality of the matter. Jazakallah khair. Um, the next question, uh, Boogeyman, if you're there. Yes. Uh, so, the question is about Mut'ah. Some of the Shias claim that Mut'ah was allowed, and the one who forbid Mut'a and stopped it was uh, Omar and Abu Bakr and that's based on a hadith uh, by Ibn Abbas and all that, you know the hadith probably did they stop it or, or was it stopped in any, or did the Prophet Sallam forbid it alright inshallah I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this and then I need to leave inshallah first of all brother Tasih did Tasih but they don't believe that Abu Bakr forbid it they don't believe they believe Umar forbid it. As a matter of fact, they argue that in the first, in the two years of the Khilafah, Abu Bakr ruled for two years. 
Uh, look what the evil u- usurping individual Abu Bakr was. He ruled for two years and he didn't make any of his sons his successor. Proper evil, isn't it? <laughs> and he didn't build any shrine for himself or palace. Anyway, they don't believe that Abu Bakr prohibited it. In fact, they believe in the two years Khilaf Abu Bakr was still practiced. They believe Umar forbid it. And based on what? Again, um, pay attention, brothers and sisters. Based on Subhanallah, this is Tashayyu. Tashayyu is just like Tashayyu, most of them, their opponents in Tashayyu and Shiism, it's like you're dealing with an unfair opponent who is arguing for the sake of arguing, not for the sake of truth. What do they do? They bring, for example, narration from Bukhari where Umar says, uh, two mut'as were allowed and I prohibit this and that mut'a. They say, oh, look, this is about mut'a, mut'a, what we do. And, you know, and people, they call it temporarily marriage. It's not even a good uh, translation. Mut'a is literally mut'a in Arabic. If you say, مثلاً, you say in Arabic, uh, this mut'a. This is mut'a. It is joy. Mut'a is a form of pleasure. So mut'a, zawajul mut'a, I always tell brothers, it should be uh, translated as pleasure marriage. Temporarily pleasure marriage. Literally pleasure marriage. Zawajul mut'a. So mut'a, they claim, was uh, prohibited by Umar. And that end of story. Salawat, let's go home and now Mut'a is halal, they claim. Well, it's nonsense, it's not like that. Yes, we have a narration in Bukhari where Mut- uh, Umar at this time says, I, uh, naha, naha You know what naha means? Naha means when you prevent something. And here's the thing a fair person, whether he's a Jew or Christian, non Muslim, atheist, considering Islam, or he wants to just study this uh, matter, he will look. What will he do, brothers and sisters? Will he look at this matter, matter of mut'a, pleasure marriage, so-called temporary marriage? Will he look at it in a holistic way? Or will he cherry-pick narrations? Now, the Twelvers, we know what they do. They cherry-pick narrations, like they do in everything else. A truth seeker, and inshallah, many Shias are included in this as well. May Allah guide them and us to the truth. They will look in a holistic way at the narrations. They look at all the narrations in a hadith and ayat al-Qur'an and tafsir. For example, they bring tafsir from Qur'an that Fulan scholar said, this verse is about mut'a. Yeah, but it's not ijma. So what? Is this Imam of Al-Sunnah, is this Mufassir now <laughs> ma'asum, Imam ma'asum, you take from him? We don't believe anybody is ma'asum except the Prophet. So the reality is that Umar, at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, al-Faruq Umar, anhu, some companions, yes, and some even of the students of the companions, practiced mut'ah. Why? Because the prohibition did not reach them. Is this impossible? What I'm saying, is this logically impossible? No. It's absolutely logically impossible, that the, especially at that time, that the prohibition did not reach their ears. So when Umar heard, because remember, Abu Bakr just ruled two years. And it was a, 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 a two years of war was included in these two years against uh, the Ridda Wars, where the true believers, the Sahaba, fought the Murtadun. Of course, in 12 years in, the Murtadun, the apostates, are the Sahaba, of Allah, upside down world. So anyway, um, and Abu Bakr's Khilafah, during his reign, radiallahu anhu, in as siddiqs reign, it was just two years. And there was war in these two years. Umar's Khilafah was one of the longest. If not the longest, but what the longest? 12 years as far as I remember. 10 or 12 years. 12, I think. And it was one of the best times. And Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, huh? the Sahab Sir, Rasulullah, he mentioned that the gates of fitna only really opened between the Muslims, really. Because before it was Abu Bakr's time, the Muslims had fight with the Murtadun. He did all gates of fitna opened after Umar's demise, when Umar was killed by the Shia saint. Abu, Lu, Abu Lu'lu, who I call Abu Lolo, Abu Lolo al-Majusi. So it was at Umar's time where there was a long period of peace and prosperity. And also, of course, there were harshness as well. There were some months, in, I think, definitely months, droughts and not much food. But generally speaking, it was a time of no fitness. And there... It reached Umar ibn Khattab that a group of people or a, or a number of people or whatever, they were doing mut'ah. 
But they hold the position as Mut'a as being correct and so on. And he scolded them for this. He criticized them. He said, I'm the Khalifa. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbid this. I'm going to forbid this. I'm going to naha. I'm going to prevent you from this. So he did not invent the wheel. The wheel, uh, the prohibition, was done by none other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's, they don't mention this in their articles and whatnot. And even if they do, they try to water it down. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have, we have solid, clear-cut, muhkam narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he himself prohibited Mecca. Now some say it's contradiction. There's, there's contradictions. Here it says at Khaybar. Here it says at this event. These are not contra contradictions. They can be all logically reconciled. Like at two events, two times. There's, there, there's ways to reconcile them. On top of it, did you know that in our books, the chain of narration which speaks, we have a hadith with the chain of narrations of Ahl al-Bayt. Yani people, Ali and his sons, for example, we have a narration in Bukhari and Muslim where Ali ibn Abi Talib narrates that Mut'a is prohibited. And not because of Umar, because the Prophet prohibited it. And in those chains of narrations, it's not Abu Huraira and these people who they all dislike. It's Ali and his descendants. Many Sunnis are not aware of this fact. That itself deserves a whole lecture. That in our narrations where Ali prohibited, where Ali, where Ali bin Abi Talib عنه, prohibits the prohibition of Mut'a by the Prophet والسلام, in those chains of narrations are the descendants of Ali. And um, yeah, we have this narration and we have narration where Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas was blind he did not allow the Mut'a, the, the Rafada allowed, because they all, all, all also misconstruct this view. They say, oh, look, Ibn Abbas believed the Mut'a. First of all, so what? Is Ibn Abbas Imam Mahzum? Is he your infallible Imam? Thanyan, no, Ibn Abbas believed it's a Rukhsa. You know what Rukhsa is in Arabic and Islam? It's like eating pork. It's eating pork in an absolute sense, always, in every circumstance, forbidden in Islam? No. In circumstances, it could be permissible or even wajib, compulsory. Like to save your life. It's rare, but it could happen. Like it what possibly, hypothetically. So hypothetically, it's possible, permissible, or even compulsory to eat pork in a very specific situation. So Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, anhuma, he believed that Mut'a is like pork. In very extreme situations, it's allowed. That's not Rafada belief. Rafada belief, Rafada have a marathon of Mut'a. It's a sex marathon. Yes, they believe. If you read the relation in narrations, you're gonna be shocked. They say the person who does mut'a and then he does ghusl. Every drop that falls from that drop, Allah creates seventy thousand whatnot angels who make istighfar for you. Whoever does mut'a one time reaches the rank of al Hussein, and then another time the rank of al Hasan, and then Ali, and whoever does so many times rank of the Prophet. Narrations that are authentic to them. So according to them, mut'a is a recommended religious act. And ibadah worship, whereas to Ibn Abbas, it was it was like eating pork, very ex exceptional. But even even that belief, guess what? He was refuted by Ali bin Abi Talib. The Sahaba refuted themselves. That's possible. None of them is impossible. None of them is uh, infallible. Sometimes they refuted themselves on matters, and the truth was with one of them. We don't deny this. So Ali bin Abi Talib came to Ibn Abbas and said to him. You are a lost man. That's a Sahih Muslim. You are a lost man on this matter. You're a lost man. The Prophet, don't you know that the Prophet prohibited it? So subhanAllah, we have Sahih narration from Ali and Bukhari Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited Mut'ah, not Umar. In that narration, the chain of transmission, in it are descendants of Ali bin Abi Talib. We have narration where Abdullah bin Abbas gave Mut'ah under very specific circumstances. Even that one, Ali was firmly against it. He said, no, it is absolutely haram. Don't you know the Prophet Naha and Thalik? Harrama al-Mut'a and so on so forth. And the Twelvers themselves, now here comes the hilarious part. Did you know that the Twelvers themselves have narration that speak in prohibition of Mut'a by Ali bin Abi Talib in their books with Sahih chain according to them? Now you might ask them, what, how do they resolve this? I told you at the beginning. 
Ah, lul bid'a, people on falsehood. Most of them are not truth seekers. They stay on the bottle. So there's scholars, for example, Majlis, he said, commented on the narration that is Sahih in Al-Kafi, that Ali prohibited, narrated the prohibition of Mut'a from the prophets. Ali said, so this must be out of Taqiyah. Ali bin Taqiyah. Audhu billah. Ali bin Abi Talib, the line of Allah. Who was he scared of? Yani Ali is less than Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas, his history testifies that Ibn Abbas wasn't scared of anybody and openly gave fatwa that Mut'a under very specific circumstances, i.e. as a rukhsa, i.e. like eating pork, is permissible. So Ibn Abbas is braver than Ali was. And you see how the Rafid have insulted Ali that this historical fact and truth has entered their hadith corpus and in order to resolve it, they're scholars of the past and today. They come up with the excuse that must be that 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 has to be uh, taqiyah. Why? Because they say muta is from the daruriyat, is from the necessities of the religion. You take muta away, uh, ha, uh, the turban heads they're gonna get a heart attack. You know, son? You take muta away, you take away an essential part of the religion. So anyway, there was almost a whole uh, lesson about muta, but there's of course more to it, but. Uh, uh, anyway, it's not one of the crucial matters. Mut'a is mas mas mas'ala fiqhiyya. I personally don't like to talk much about mut'a and these issues. It's, I like to stick to the more the, uh, the fundamental issues. Imama, ilm al ghayb asma, and stuff like that. But of course, I'm at the service of you guys. So, guys, I have been with you 2 hours 42 minutes. I've answered your questions. There is no promise. Yes. I don't know if I'm going to do this again. I don't know if I do this again. If I do this, I, inshallah, I will be at your service. But uh, but but please do not think that this is going to be a regular thing or that I'm going to be uh, uh, every Monday at this time available. I'm, I know everybody's busy. I'm a family father. I study full-time university. Uh, languages are my field. And uh, I don't have time. But... It, on an irregular basis, sometimes, maybe, inshallah, perhaps, I'm going to be at your service. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, my last advice at you is, and to me, is that, you know, uh, uh, the Rafidi sect is a toxic sect, is an extreme sect. This is what it is, according to us. So it brings up emotions, and when we see kufr and shirk in the name of Ahl Bayt, but... Um, but Always try to calm down, and this advice goes to myself as well. And remember, at the end of the day, they're humans. Many of them are our neighbors. We live with them. Even if we don't live with them, and even if you live in a country, you have zero of them. Remember, they live in other countries. They live with us. The best way of da'wah is to show the falsehood. Nothing will ruin that. You see, I'm a blunt person. Play, uh, yani straightforward, frank. Calling a spade a spade, there's nothing wrong with it. Calling this kufr, of course. Calling this person a zindiq, the scholars, of course. But especially with the layman, try to be as, as, as soft as possible, even if it's difficult. Look, I'm criticizing myself here. I'm not saying that I'm perfect, that I have never lashed out, and I, that I will never lash, that I will never lash out in this future, or that I never have lashed out in the past. But, you know, I'm someone in public and uh, it's not the first time I'm saying this. I've said this many times on my social media and on other places. And remember also, it's not your duty to debate Ahl Bida and Christians. And if you have no knowledge, you should avoid that. Not because we are scared. We are certainly not scared of the Rafabah and the religion. This battle religion full of falsehood, kufr and zandaka and ridiculous rituals. It's not about that. It's about you need a certain amount of knowledge. And leave it to the experts. And of course, study. Study. Go to 12ashia.net. Uh, go to shiascans.com. Go to give to shias. Go to you punctured the arc.com. Uh, WordPress.com. Go to Sunday Defense. Watch our videos. Yes. But to be too much involved as a, a layman uh, who's not specialized in this field, uh, yani, this is not good. Uh, other than that, I hope you enjoyed. Hada wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallah khayy for your time and uh, your efforts. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum brother. Take care. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam.